Good morning, everyone. Who has had trouble logging on to Wi-Fi? Everyone. Um, so if you're with a university anywhere in the world, you should be able to use the EduRome login details. So that should be your first preference. If you still can't get it to work, then we've set up some accounts. Uh, unfortunately, the university wouldn't set up one account with one password. They had to set up multiple accounts. Each of these T, zero, so on accounts can only hold about 25 people each. So if you can't get on, try the next one. Try the next one. Try the next one. Um, sorry about that. We've set a generic password. Try your best. And um, if, if you can't log on, then sorry, no, no Wi-Fi. So, uh, did everybody get those details down or do you need them again? Okay. Do you want them down? Put it back. Okay. There you go. Maybe we just take a few more minutes then. <laughs> Do you want to copy this? I'll just leave that up there while we go over our general housekeeping. So, first of all, welcome to the second day of, of what is the Australasian Ornithological Conference Week. Uh, today's morning workshop is best practice methods for bird tagging for research. And um, a big thank you, firstly, to Grace Maglio, who's done an amazing job of coordinating the workshop and coordinating many, many people uh, involved in this workshop. So thanks, everyone, for being a part of Grace's workshop. I'd uh, also like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Larrakia people, and um, later on today the Larrakia Land and Sea Rangers should be joining us, so um, please welcome them uh, along with every other conference delegate here. The toilets are just outside in the foyer, around the back, so um, find, find those in any of the breaks. There's also a water station just out near the kitchen in the foyer area. Tea and coffee, um, just for today, uh, we're suggesting that people buy, buy the tea and coffee from the cafe. We're not supplying tea and coffee, uh, but we are supplying morning tea and afternoon tea snacks. So, um, so morning tea and afternoon tea snacks are provided during the breaks. Lunch is BYO. There's a cafeteria on campus. There's also Casuarina Square just down the road if you like um, a walk at lunchtime. Um, any other major 
issues. Any questions about today's workshop? If you didn't get to register, uh, register in the breaks. The ladies will be at the front desk later on. And if you have a talk that you'd like to upload for the scientific program of the conference, then we ask that you upload it during the upload sessions tomorrow morning onwards. Uh, not today, because we don't have our download hub set up just yet. <coughs> okay, slides. All right, so we're removing the Wi-Fi password. Hopefully people have that down. Which one? Sorry? Welcome, Rob's. Welcome. Okay, now um, most of you filled out the pre-workshop survey, uh, except for Marcel. Um, no, the idea of the pre... What, what we expected was 30 to 40 people and we were going to have sort of a workshop scenario. We got 100 people, 80, 90, 70, 80, 90, 100 people. People were still reg trying to register last night and it ended up being free-for-all. So in terms of a workshop plan... Uh, we're not going to do much, we're not doing anything during this three and a half hours. It'll be as talking and, and giving you an overall look at tagging. Um, uh, forgotten my train of thought. No, I'm um, tagging and then we will have a tag, we've got a tag talk space. That's where you will get to collaborate, to talk to each other, to talk to the presenters, to find out what um, other people are doing and speak to them about your future projects or speak to them about problems. Um, and it, this is all about talking, getting everybody with experience and people that want to learn about tagging in the same room um, to, 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 to speak to each other and learn from each other. The surveys, um, the people that did do the surveys, um, most of you have some experience some are very experienced, some have just been helping in, in projects, and um, about 20% of the people that filled the survey uh, are here to learn more. Where you all come from as far as organisations is right there. So, mate, bird, you know, birding, I can look here, <laughs> birding universities and the like. So that's where the people that you know, did this, this is roughly where you've, you've come from. Oh, and then you, at, there was a question at the end of what this was to help us try to organise uh, organize today, what, what you were hoping to get to get um, from the workshop. Um, that's that one. So, uh, um, were there any questions so far or, or we've got a few minutes for questions or is there anything anyone wanted to ask before we got started at all? All right, I'll just quickly, because I've got a couple of minutes. So what happened was um, ex uh, expedition last year, mm. 2018. It happened, expedition last year, 2018, it just um, Northwest Australia expedition, um, waiter and turns. Um, it happened that there was seven people with hands-on experience putting satellite trackers on birds. Um, we got hit by a cyclone, and so our catching plans went out the window. So what we decided to do was have this little meeting, of, of like a mini workshop talk meeting, and we sat around with um, these experienced people and then everybody else that was interested and we chatted about tagging. And what the reason, um, and so what came out of this, there was so much information, but we we're all sort of trying to work alone. Well, we were all working alone. The, um, the clincher, I guess, for me was Dean Ingwerson, um, who will be speaking a bit today, got some microwave telemetry, two gram tags, which ended up being 2.1, 2.2, 2.3 grams. He contacted MTI because that ended up being too heavy for his bird, you'll hear about it, for his project. And he needed to design a harness, um, a light harness, so he could use these tags on the region honey eater. He contacted Kathy at microwave telemetry um, in the US. Kathy said, Oh, Maureen Christie in Australia orders those for shorebirds. And Maureen put, put um, Dean on to me and we had a meeting. And um, as it turns out, I had something suitable. But, you know, Dean from BirdLife Australia in Victoria had to contact the US to find out that 
the shorebird people were using these two grand tags. So then I, and then it was just, you know, with discussions with Amanda and other people, it was like, yeah, we need to do a workshop. We need to get all these people together. And I'm actually quite surprised, having been involved in shorebird tagging, how much experience there is in Australia and how much time and uh, blood, sweat and tears we could have saved if I, if I got to talk to Dean earlier, you know, two, two three, four years ago. Um, so collaboration, this is about talking to each other and learning from each other. And, and the only outcome could be is, uh, the only outcome is a better outcome for our research. All right. And for the, well, for our research and the birds. So we've got our, we've got a couple of sponsors for the workshop today. And um, we've got Druid Technology as our first sponsor presenter to join us today. Just bring it up. I haven't set that one up yet. Okay. So, yep. Uh, good morning, er everyone. Uh, thank you for Amanda's uh, accommodation and thank you for uh, the invitation from the uh, conference. Uh, I'm a little bit in uh, disorder status because I came here last night, uh, actually this morning, uh, around 2 p.m., so <laughs> uh, 2 a.m., so I, I just uh, have a very short uh, sleep. So uh, forgive me if I have a lot of, uh, you know, like, uh, speaking issue, <laughs> because English is not my mother language. Uh, anyway, uh, so I'm uh, Guo Zheng Li uh, from Druid Technology. Uh, Li is my family name. It's uh, the same as Bruce Lee. Uh, it's very... <laughs> okay, and uh, uh, today I will introduce uh, the Bu, uh, which is uh, our product. And uh, we do this uh, product to, for sharing of ideas, designs, data, and the labeling. So when we talk about labeling, it's like uh, when we do behavior recognition, we first need uh, all the accelerometer and then we need to label all the behavior and we design the system for that. Okay, so uh, we're a pretty young company. Uh, we established uh, like three and a half years ago. And when we do uh, establish our company, you know, there's a lot of uh, like a famous company, you know, like uh, who will give a presentation later, like low tech, or like uh, several company, a uh, new company like uh, Onitella, who's established uh, like five years uh, before us. And when we establish our company, we just think, okay, so there's not a lot of things left us to do. They just uh, do a lot of amazing things, and uh, you know, what should we do to help? Uh, the scientists to do their research. So then we finally find, okay, so we still can do something because at our imagination, you know, we thought uh, uh, the scientists will do research like that. But actually, you know, <laughs> they do research like this. You know, they spend a lot of time, you know, when we, we cut cost, you know, they cost a lot to do a lot of preparation work for their really research and the to get the data and uh, to promote the brilliant idea. So they basically have like four different aspects. The first one is time. So they spend a lot of time for data collection, processing, and visualization. And the second thing, they just are looking for the fund because the device and the service is very expensive. And the third one, you know, uh, the user experience, you know, they need to pro programming, they need to download the data, and they need to do all the data processing. And the final thing is it's really hard to share the data with other people. And it's hard to manage all the data because it's all in your computer and sometimes you need to do coding to organize all the data. So that is all the cost. So what 
we try to do is simplify the pre preparation work and uh, we just help the, uh, the scientists to focus on their brilliant idea. So our philosophy is that we deploy the, the tag on the birds and it's done. And you just uh, go back home and just collect the data and do all the things on your computer. So if we want to do that, there's supposed to be have like four key concepts. The first one is need to be solar driven. So all of our trigger have the solar panel on that. Because of that, you can just uh, uh, have enough uh, sustainable energy to keep on driven the tracker and uh, let it last for three, five, or even longer year. The bottleneck will be the lifespan of the lithium battery. And the second thing, uh, we will have like long distance communication. We, this, the, prim the primary uh, choice will be 2G because it's very uh, widespread and it's very stable, but unfortunately in uh, Australia, there's no 2G anymore. Uh, the, the last uh, uh, provider just uh, terminated their service uh, this year. We know that because uh, we just uh, come across this problem. So we also provide 3G and we just uh, launched a new technology called MBLT, which is supposed to be merged to 5G. And the third thing is because now it's a mobile phone uh, period. So everyone has mobile phones. So all, of all the tech, we can just uh, link to with your mobile phone. And the last one, uh, so we have the real-time accelerometer. So it's used for um, like behavior recognition and uh, all the behavior uh, analysis. So I will just uh, uh, divide it to four parts to introduce our uh, like highlight feature of our device. The first one is modulation for deployment. So this is one of our uh, devices. It's, uh, First design, it's called the Flex. It's first designed for the uh, neck band. So uh, we just uh, make the core part as the tracker and uh, we made the different uh, uh, flexibility uh, choices for the uh, different diameter of the ring size. So basically you just uh, bring this uh, device and uh, with all different size of uh, you know, band and you can just uh, deploy it on different birds. And we also can do a lot of customization with our collaborator. So this is an example for, oops, oh, so there's a mouse. So there's an example for just uh, combine the uh, traditional band with uh, our tracker. And you can also uh, change the tracker with, uh, uh, as a backpack, you know, with some modulation, but it's the same tracker. And this is the other thing called Lego. So uh, this one, we just uh, uh, try to avoid all the feather uh, coverage. So basically, it's also the same module, but it have a different elevation for the solar panel. So uh, it can use uh, for a different kind of species like gulls, uh, ducks, and uh, hawks, all the predators. And uh, the other case use this things is you can just also make a, a, a leg band. So uh, here show they have just uh, do a lot of customization uh, with this core uh, product. And it's, we deployed that on the crane and it's just uh, passed the uh, uh, fly the Himalaya for uh, the second year. And this will be the third year if they just uh, do the migration. Uh, and uh, we spend a lot of time to make it small because uh, that is very important and is, uh, I think, the most uh, interest uh, where the scientists uh, focus on. So we made a Lego Mini. So this is uh, uh, the standard one uh, with a large scale will be, large scale manufacturer will be six gram, but we can uh, customize to five gram. So it's all like full function. So basically it have the GPS, uh, positioning, it have uh, the GSM uh, communication, and it also have a real-time accelerometer. <laughs> so uh, we already deployed a lot of that in Europe and some in China, and uh, it's got a very good successful result. It gives you a thousand, uh, up to a thousand uh, fix per day. And uh, you can see it also can do some modulation. Uh, they just uh, design some uh, like uh, housing to lift it up, you know, for some case uh, for the gauss. 
And uh, uh, the last thing, you know, uh, the, the three products we mentioned already covered five gram, uh, like 20 gram to 30 gram, but there's a gap in between, like from five gram to uh, like 20 gram. So what we do is we also provide the uh, like OEM PCBA, uh, you know, it's just, a, uh, I'll show you the last slide. It's just like on the corner like that. It's, it's core uh, working uh, components uh, for our device. So all the uh, collaborator or researcher, they can do their own housing and they can customize that with 3D printing and uh, everything just, uh, you know, you can do any uh, modification for those things. For, uh, that's the first thing for de deployment for the hardware design. And we also have something for uh, like uh, operation because the operation system is also very important. We call that uh, uh, the Bill OS. Uh, basically, it have uh, accurate position and it have real-time uh, activity monitoring. It have uh, the conditional triggering uh, algorithm and it also can connect with a mobile phone. So here show that uh, how accurate it is. You see, this is uh, it's supposed to be like uh, I'm not quite sure it's pretty quite uh, stable bird. And uh, when it stay there for uh, hundreds of points, it's just within a very, there's, there's no uh, drifting for the GPS. And this is show that uh, the activity intensity uh, distribution uh, almost a month. So it shows a very uh, like a, a previous uh, pattern for that. And this is uh, show a flamingo walking along the bay of the lake. So basically it's just to give you every uh, 20 seconds for a, uh, for a fix. And this is show that, you know, with the conditional triggering, you can measure the uh, fly uh, status. So when it's fly, it's give you a very intense, uh, uh, like a flying pattern and a fix. And as a comparison, we just close that function. So you can see the difference. It's a, like a, when we talk about the TV, we talk a 4K resolution and compare to the previous one. And uh, we also can con connect with mobile phone. So if you have a mobile phone, you can change all the uh, working status of the uh, device by yourself, when even you don't have any network. And the third one is uh, cloud sourcing for data collection. So I will just uh, focus on this uh, uh, figure. So at the very beginning from the uh, left side, so when we do bending things, people just, uh, you know, all contribute. For example, if I bend the bird and uh, that gentleman find that bird, it's just uh, told me, okay, so we both see that bird. And then uh, like Argos, they, they just uh, deploy, uh, launch some uh, satellite signal and this is the second stage, but the data stream is very limited. And then, because we have a lot of cell phone, the base station is distributed all the way. Uh, then we can just uh, use a uh, GPS and GSM tracker, and uh, the data volume will be much larger. But at this moment, we think about everyone have cell phone. We have billions of cell phone. If we can turn the cell phone to the base station, then we can minimize the size a lot and everyone can contribute and uh, do the data sharing and uh, all the data labeling. So this is our new product. We just uh, do the test yesterday. Uh, basically, it don't have the GSM or long distance uh, communication. It's only use a Bluetooth 5.0, but the longest distance we tested yesterday is uh, one kilometer. So basically, if you can see the bird or if the bird is around you, you can just uh, uh, you know, use your cell phone searching for that, connect with that, and download all the data. And uh, so you can also, if you really see the bird, you can connect with uh, your mobile phone. And uh, what you can do is you record all the video, and you can just uh, download all the real-time uh, 25 hertz uh, uh, accelerometer 3 access uh, real-time data. So then you can just do all the labeling and do all the modeling things. Actually, uh, Mr. Yuhui will 
but he's also a colleague of me. It will give a presentation of how we do the onboard computing for uh, behavior recognition. And uh, I hope everyone can join his uh, presentation. And the first, uh, the, the last one is the platform for all the visualization things. Uh, we have, we provide the, we call the uh, SAS system. It's a software as a service. Uh, and it's have, everyone have their own uh, accounts and you can just log your account if you have the internet. And uh, we provide uh, plenty of tools to do all the things. And this is show that you can use your cell phone and you just input all the uh, like uh, uh, information of the animal. So basically you just uh, have a electricity, uh, electronic uh, card for your uh, targeted uh, uh, animal. <laughs> and uh, like geofence, all the things. Um, and we also support all the uh, data sharing uh, like platform like, uh, uh, like MoveBank. And uh, this is all the visualization, it's all in our uh, like uh, online uh, data, data base service. <laughs> Show all the uh, migration pathway and all the detailed migration pathway. Uh, like all the feature for data analysis. Uh, uh, this is a case uh, to show that. There, there's a mouse there to show that if you have an administration account, so then you can just uh, set up several sub accounts for your collaborator or your students. And you can do all the authorization for uh, the modulate function of uh, the platform and the the device, you can just uh, distribute the device to different of your students and it's just uh, you know, very efficient for uh, like data management. Hmm? Okay, and this is uh, uh, like one show the visualization. Basically, we will launch this service at the end of uh, August. Uh, this one uh, is show that you know, several birds is migrate, uh, you know, can you see that spot is is a different, and we also have this one. Uh, this is just uh, uh, like uh, the birds of fly away. It's a hawk on the Tibet. So, and we also provide the renew plan for any like accidental. Hey. Yeah, well done. Well, this is uh, a flamingo deployed a a device, and well, we not anymore. By uh, links and it's buried in the ground. So uh, we just uh, told them, okay, so your bird is dead and uh, it's, uh, you, you need to find that. And they go there three times and they can't find anything. And uh, it's just uh, keep on bumping the signal and it's always says it's there. And they just finally find this uh, eaten the flamingo uh, with our device. Yeah. And uh, thank you, that's all for our sharing. And it's really, yeah. Thanks very much. We'll save questions for Druid okay. technology um, at the morning tea, possibly, yeah, or at the end of yeah, the sure. workshop. <coughs> and next up, we'll hear from Low Tech. Uh, we've got Kat coming down. Which one is this? Um, sponsorship presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Catalina, and I work for Lotec and Set, which was Sirtrek um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but now we have rebranded, and now we have the Lotec name. Uh, and I come today to talk to you about tagging with our diversity of tags. Um, so, first off, this is a tracking workshop. We need to talk about where can we attach things on a bird. And uh, basically, the most common one that is uh, used are backpacks. So you can either use a harness or you can either uh, glue it on the bird. And you can use the wings as like literally a backpack or you can use the legs uh, for a leg loop. Another way to put it, to put it on the bird is a tail mount. 
uh, please be mindful that for uh, both gluon and tail mounts, when the bird molds, that feather is going to go away, and your tag is going to go away. Um, also as necklaces, so necklaces are mainly used for, uh, for game birds, also as a leg mount. So in New Zealand, um, we use them for kiwi birds and in seabirds for geolocators. It's really useful. It's a very good attachment uh, for those types of species. Or it can be used uh, for big raptors as um, attached to the wing. Um, so I'm going to start with geolocators. Um, geolocators, uh, they can uh, be very small. They can be 0 0.3 grams. And it, they're absolutely great for, for big migrations. The thing is that you need to retrieve them. And they're not very accurate. They're 200 kilometers accuracy, which is not very accurate. But if you have big migrations from New Zealand to Japan, then go to Alaska, coming back to New Zealand, then it's, it's, that's not a big problem. There's only one location a day. <laughs> And uh, there's light interference. The way that it uh, finds out the location is with the sunlight. Uh, there, are no latitude, there is no latitude during equinoxes, and the data processing is complicated. Um, but where can you put a geolocator? So the best place to put it is on the back or on the leg. The blue, the blue tags is where to put it. The orange one is don't put it there because you need to recapture them. So you don't want to put it on the tail because it, it, it loses the tail feather. That's, that's your tag. That's all your data. And uh, a lot of people cry. And well, because if you spend a lot of money, it's, it's very daunting that you're not going to get your data back or as a necklace or as a, um, a wing tag. So you use it as a leg mount or a, ha a harness mount. And just to give you an example, this was a really good study on golden winged warblers. So the, they, the, this team was going to the Appalachian Mountains and the States, and they wanted to go and um, get, retrieve the, da the data back, retrieve their, their, sta their, their tags after a year of waiting for these birds. And then suddenly they had a warning of a tornado coming through, so they had to evacuate the area and then wait for a week or so to go back and see if their birds were there. Because when they went before the tornado, they, were, they saw them, they had the tornado, uh, tornado warning, they had to go away, and then when they came back a week and a half later, the birds were there. The information that they got was that somehow the birds, after doing that big migration, so they migrate from the, from the States to South America and then go back, and the birds somehow migrated south to Florida and to Cuba to avoid the tornado. And, and they found out that type of data with, with this geolocators. Um, now, I'm going to talk to you about GPS tags. So they can be very small. Um, the very small ones, you need to recapture them. So we have uh, GPS tags of one gram. Um, down, remote download is possible. Uh, when the tags are a little bit bigger because they need kind of like a little bit more energy and a bigger battery. Um, and they start from, um, uh, from 2.9 grams. Uh, accuracy is absolutely amazing. We have 10 meters accuracy. Uh, also, we have created a new firmware that to extend the battery, there's a compromise that is a little bit less accurate than with normal, um, the normal firmware. And uh, we call that SWIFT fixes. And um, that extends the battery to almost double. Also, um, they're very good for good, um, uh, very good for home range and migration. Um, and the cons for some species are still too big. One gram is too much. Um, they're energy hungry and needs to see the sky, which means do not put it on the leg, because if you put it on the leg, the, le the, the body of the bird is going to create another environmental barrier. Okay, so that's the blue tags is where you should put a GPS tag. <laughs> right, so we have uh, two different like branches of our pinpoint tags, our GPS tags, is that if you can recapture, then we have certain mo models. If you can't recapture, 
then we have other models. So for example, when you can recapture, you can use a pinpoint store on board that starts from one gram, or you can use a pinpoint beacon that starts from three grams. The pinpoint beacon, that means that it has another, so it has a, v, a GPS antenna, but it has another antenna that you will, will program on when a VHF beacon will come on for you to find the bird, recapture, and download your data. Now, if you can't recapture, then you have three options. Pinpoint VHF download. So you can't recapture or you don't want to borrow your bird, but you are able to approach within 500 meters to download the data. So now you have a pinpoint VHF download that has the GPS, has the beacon to allow you to get near the animal, and then a VHF download system that will allow you to download the data when you're near enough. And that starts from three grams. Um, the other option is using the Argo satellite system, and that starts from 3.5. So it's GPS locations, and every third loca successful location that is taken, that information is taken to the um, Argo satellite system, and then you are at home with a cup of tea, getting your data back off a bird that is in Japan. Um, or we have a much bigger tag that starts from 40 grams, and that's using another system that is called the Iridium Satellite System. Um, and just to give you a couple of examples of that tag, we develop um, some, um, some uh, neck necklaces um, for swans. And because originally we only had the pinpoint, the pinpoint Iridium of a backpack one without solar panels, and we um, developed this this, uh, this tag for a special project, and they wanted to know what was going on with black swans. Black swans are a pest in New Zealand, um, and they wanted to understand their behavior. And um, I don't know if uh, you are into shorebirds, you probably know about uh, the project on Pacific Golden Plovers of Pucurikoro Miranda uh, Shorebird Sanctuary, and they use Pinpoint Argo 75 on Pacific Golden Plovers, and you can see one of the birds, it's very difficult to, uh, it, that one doesn't have the tag, um, but the cool thing, <laughs> the cool thing about, about uh, this um, beautiful, um, beautiful uh, Golden Plovers is that they were kept, they were, um, they were tagged in Coromandel, New Zealand, so in the North Island, kind of in the east of the North, uh, North Island. And then they named the birds Jojo, Amanda, and Jim for their volunteers. Um, and they're telling a very wonderful story. So from New Zealand, um, Amanda and, and Jojo, they want to like took off very quickly, like female do, uh, do, and then the male was a little bit slack and taking his time, Jimmy, Jim was taking his time, and you can see here that um, Amanda was, was kind of like on, a, on its way um, to Alaska and Jojo as well, and then Jim was in Guam having a holiday over there, and the latest data shows that Jim is in Siberia breeding, and Amanda and Jojo are in Alaska. Um, now, I know that it's kind of like doesn't make sense to go from the like the flashes technology to VHF, but we need to um, to always come to where everything started. So VHF beeper tags um, they can be very small, 0 0.19 grams. So it's it's Still good. Uh, you can um, tag monarch butterflies and dragonflies with that. Um, accuracy depends on the observer. So you need to go to the field and walk with a receiver and antenna in trying to find your bird. Uh, works in burrows, tree holes, dense forest. Uh, you can find birds and observe them, and it's one frequency per individual. So if, if you, have, uh, you have done beeper tags in the past, is your traditional, uh, radio tracking with the beep, beep, beep each bird, and then you need to scan through another bird, and then you need to dial the, the frequency. Um, and then the cons is manual tracking. You need to spend a lot of time to understand what, where the bird is going, um, and it's not good for migratory species. And I put a little asterisk there because I want to talk to you about that. 
Where to put the VHF tag? It's just wonderful. You can put it everywhere. Um, and and the and you can think, okay, why why a, um, a leg mount? And that's what we do in New Zealand. That's what we do with the kiwi. And um, with the kiwi, they capture, they put tags, via leg bands on the kiwi, and then when when they are incubating, it gives a different signal to them, to the researcher, and then they are able to go and get the egg, put it in a safe environment so it's not um, it's not uh, eaten by predators, and then um, put the, the babies, the, sh the chicks, on a crash. When they're big enough, they put them back on, on their original area. Um, but I wanted to finish now with VHF code attack. So instead of the normal beep, 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 think about a cat purring. So it's going to be brr. So that beep is going to be the coded. And they can be very small, 0 0.23 grams actually, not 29. Um, they can have a long life depending on the model and the burst interval. So when I'm saying that beep, instead of having milliseconds, milliseconds, uh, pulses per minute, you're going to have the burst interval. So how that is going to sound like. Um, it's very good for presence absence studies. Does not require manual tracking. You can do manual tracking, but does not require manual tracking. Um, uh, one frequency, you can, you, you use only one frequency. Uh, five, and you can have more than 500 individuals, base stations, and uh, you can put base stations on strategic places, so stopovers, breeding areas, f uh, feeding stations, colonies, etc. It's difficult to manual tracking, and the base stations come to a cost. So this is what I was telling you about how it, it changes. Um, so these are how the base stations look like, and each one of those dots, there's another um, workshop in the afternoon um, talking about the co collaborative uh, um, network, and this is the MODIS network. And this is uh, researchers working together, each one of those dots as a base station. And as, as you can see, they have uh, deployed them in a lot of animals. And just to give you an example of the technology, this is a... Um, gray cheek, cheek thrushes, and is the migration from Colombia to Canada. And, but what's happening over here? Because you see a bunch of dots in the Americas, but what's going on? So in here, you have 70, 78 stations in, the, in Western Australia, uh, 16 base stations in, in, in Northern Territory, and one base station, one, another one coming up in Taiwan. So this is a really cool technology that is happening at the moment. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kat. Uh, next up, we'll hear from Ornatella Tracking Company. Morning, everyone. Um, as it was announced, uh, I would like to represent Ornitella here. My name is Ramona Zidalis, first offer listed here, and my colleague Mindo Gizdagis is also here. And well, we would like to talk to you if someone is interested. And I'm going to present what what we have and what we what we can offer. Both of us, we are ornithologists who started our company because we wanted. Let's say when we fought better facts, we used other companies before. And we started in, in, in 2015, so also not too long ago. And uh, well, we'll see where we got. Um, all right, this is uh, what we have. We, we develop and supply GPS, GSM transmitters for birds. Basically, we specialize only in this technology, logging GPS and sensor data. and sending using 
telecommunication network, basically GSM, using 2G and 3G networks, and soon we will have to upgrade to, to 4G because 3G is already not being developed anymore in some countries. And here you see a variety of, of, of tags that we currently provide, and there are more modifications, so it's, they come in, in different, different shapes and sizes uh, designed for different species, sort of, uh, is it mouse visible? No. So uh, on top there are uh, tags for backpack attachments with uh, a few modifications of, of, of loops for harness. And at the bottom we have neck colors and leg mount transmitters on the bottom left, which are for, for cranes and also Tagil transmitters, like here, to, which are used on uh, condors and 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 vultures, and uh, sort of our transmitters are relatively big, and these are our smallest units. Smallest is weighting 10 grams, and with elevated solar solar panel 12 grams, because GPS and GSM technology is somewhat limited of how small we can go. Okay, and what our transmitters do? So first of all, obviously they lock GPS information such as location, altitude, speed, and direction at different intensity, depending how battery allows. So it could be as frequent as every second. Additionally, they lock sensor data such as 3D accelerometer, 3D magnetometer, light, intensity, and temperature. Uh, sort of instantaneous information from these sensors is associated with each GPS position. Uh, and it's also possible to log these sensors independently up to at uh, intensities of up to 50 hertz. And for uh, specific studies, it is also possible to add additional sensors such as depth for, which is used for diving birds, or barometric altimeter. And as I said before, all uh, data are automatically uploaded to the server using GPS or 3G telecommunication network. And uh, our transmitters have advanced transmitter function controls, what we call, could be used geofences, which I will talk about later in, in, in the following slides. A GPS could be recorded in burst mode, meaning that Instead of one GPS position, it tags could record up to 600 GPS positions at one second intervals. And some, some studies or some researchers apparently need and use that. Uh, we have separate day and night settings and also automatic flight detection, which is based on sensors and automatic uh, setting detect, uh, adjustment depending on available power meaning that once battery charge is going down, GPS becomes less frequently recorded. And obviously all these, all these settings are controlled by a user via uh, online control panel. So it's, it's, it's quite a number of parameters which can be changed basically any time when, when transmitter is already on a bird. So it's possible to change your mind and, and adjust settings. So this is how our control panel looks like. Sort of, it's a first view. Basically, each 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 customer gets own uh, unique login, and and here we have we, on the top there are let's say transmitters. Is it most visible? No. Okay, it doesn't matter. Transmitters listed. Then small preview map then it's possible to download data in KML, CSV, and GPX formats on depending on what or whatever date period to choose. And it is also possible to go into device settings and, and start changing, changing different settings which are being sent to the transmitter during the following GSM session. I'm not going to talk about details, but this is what could be done. Sort of, there are a lot of 
a lot of a lot of setting adjustments that that could be then done depending on need and transmitter performance. Uh, some features that I would like to explain: geofences is if this is uh, an area where transmitter automatically changes its settings when it senses that it is in this area, and this example shows uh, transmitter logging uh, GPS positions at different intensities. Sort of when it is outside of geofence, we, do we have a pointer? And how to get the mouse here? Or pointer? Uh, you need to, swipe up. to do what? Pointer? No. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Okay. Uh, the area sort of not hashed, it's sort of outside of geofence and it's logging positions every 10 seconds. Once transmitter senses that is inside green area, which is geofence 2, it automatically changes to logging positions every 5 seconds, so it's sort of more frequent dots. And once it enters into the red zone, which is geofence 1, and here it has settings for position logging every one second, then we see it's very frequent, and then this automatically changes once it leaves out and sort of changes depending on geofence settings, and these geofences sort of could be build up of, of uh, 10 different polygons for geofence 1 and geofence 2, so we have that being used quite frequently, for example, People don't need to have positions very frequently when bird is on the nest, so around the nest, geofence doesn't record positions frequently, but it locks very frequent positions in some area of interest, which, let's say, in Europe, it's very commonly wind farm areas where people care what, what raptors are doing. Um, another somewhat similar feature is when people care about flight. So we have automatic flight detection algorithm, which is based on, on, on transmitter sensors. So basically once it senses that bird is flying, it turns GPS position logging every second and, and stops such intensive logging once bird stops flying. So this is an example where flying bird can, can log positions very, very frequently. But this detection alg algorithm is species specific. So it, depends a little bit how species moves, how frequently flaps. So, so it may need to be tuned up for different species, but since it is remotely adjustable, it's usually not, not a big problem. Uh, what I already mentioned also is automatic setting adjustment based on available power. So here's an example how this could be used. So when battery is charged to 100%, GPS positions are locked at five minute intervals and as battery goes down, which could be because of unfavorable weather conditions and doesn't recharge uh, too well or, or, or transmitter is being pushed too hard and, and it uses more power when it recharges. So when battery drops, it kind of slows down automatically and doesn't drain it completely. And uh, also I mentioned GPS burst, meaning multiple GPS position logging. Uh, so this could be stopped as well when, when battery goes down to a certain to a certain percentage. And the same about intensive sensor logging. So so these kind of features help to, to save battery from from pushing it too hard and draining transmitter very quickly. Uh, some examples. So this is one of our first birds which we tagged in 2015, and it's a spotted eagle, which we tagged as juvenile nephania, so it's still transmitting today, and by now it did four round trips to West Africa and, and come back, keeps coming back to the same area and locked 380 GPS positions until now, and the, the transmitter already getting tired by now, but, but still still working okay. In a sense, getting tired, its internal lithium battery still has limited lifetime and, and we, we kind of start losing capacity with time. 
Another example is uh, accelerometer data, which can be logged at independent schedules, and is it, it is often used to uh, identify bird behavior. So this is chart is showing five seconds of accelerometer logging at uh, 20 hertz frequency, and this is goose flying, and and these. Uh, uh, blue line is sort of showing basically wing beats, and by that we can say that it makes four wings, wing beats per second. And if we say, we take another behavior of the same individual, then it's not flying but walking, we see completely different patterns. So basically, probably many people know that accelerometer can be can be effectively used to to classify bird behaviors, and this is one of the examples. Another example is uh, cormoran tracking with depth sensor. So basically, we start with attaching transmitter. Okay, we'll speed up. Attaching transmitter to a bird, and and we get we get we get the track as as usual transmitter does, and then we have uh, automatic depth sensing. So this is small graph showing three weeks of, of cormorant diving recording. So we can see that bird does dives every day. Then we can zoom in and look at uh, diving at one day. So during one day we see cormorant had three diving sessions. Then we can see in one this uh, diving session and here we can identify depth and every single dive it did or we can zoom in even at a single dive at 10 hertz and see what were did, how, how long it spent underwater, and, and with accelerometer data, it can even show these feet kicks and so on. So it's very nice information. Transmitter deployment methods, I will run very quickly through here. So typical is backpack attachment using body harness, wing harness, and leg loop harness. So these are basically what was, has been used with our tags. Could be tester tape attachment as well as on cormorant feather. Some people used glue attachment to the back of a bird. Neck collar transmitters for swans or geese, uh, like necklace transmitters for great bastards they were used, leg mount transmitters for cranes, or patagial transmitters for condors and vultures. And also we have implantable transmitters for diving birds. And uh, how are transmitters are used? This map shows uh, one location per transmitter where our tags are. So we basically work globally on all continents except Antarctica. And we have customers in over 40 countries. And as far as we know, more than 80 bird species have been tagged to date. And thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thank you. Our uh, next session is all about attachment methods. So how do we attach all these really great tags to the birds? And we're going to hear from a range of researchers that have done the work uh, on various bird species. So here's the attachment slide just from the survey. Okay, just very quickly from the surveys, this is what I could decipher out of the answers um, as far as what, what's been used in, for the people that did the surveys. Um, so, stop looking up there. Wing harness, um, tape to feathers, leg mount. You can just read it there. So that's, what's, that's the experience we have in the room. So the speakers that we have had, ex have had experience with what they're talking about, but there are other people. At the end of each session, Dean's first with some harnesses. At the end of the session, um, we'll be asking, okay, anyone else have experience with harnesses? And you will put your hand up and look around the room and, and, and try to remember at least a couple of people to speak to later, okay? Um, and in terms of attachment methods, like I said, the tag talk table, we have dummy transmitters um, that, that can be threaded um, um, into the various harnesses that you might be um, interested in and you will be able to take that home, just so you've got an idea of leg loop harness, you'll get a dummy transmitter, 
threaded with, an, and you can thread it yourself with crimps and um, with the, um, and take that home. A, a sample of your the harness you're interested in. I've got about a hundred, around about a hundred dummy, three D printed transmitters that um, available for that. Okay, Dean. Oh, did you want to do that? No, last. Oh, Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you for having me along. Um, Grace said earlier about me uh, getting in touch with her and then finding out about harnesses and transmitters being used on shorebirds. Uh, it's just because I'm ignorant. All I think about is bu uh, bush birds and woodland birds, so not necessarily anyone else's fault. Uh, I want to talk about, uh, well, I guess this is a case study of the work that we've done on Regent honey eaters over the last decade, radio tracking them when we've done captive releases in northeast Victoria. Uh, my co collaborator uh, for most of this work has been Glenn Johnson uh, from the Victorian Government Department. Uh, for those who've never, who don't know them, these are the coolest birds that exist. Uh, they're also now critically endangered, so we think there's uh, down... Uh, 500 is probably an optimistic estimate of how many may exist in the wild. Um, the key thing to note there off that so slide is that they weigh 35 to 48 grams. Uh, so I look in envy at most of the transmitters that have been talked about so far today and the amazing things that they do. We're still down at the uh, somewhat rudimentary end of the scale, though that's just recently changed, and I'll talk about that at the end. So just to give a couple of slides of background, we've done five captive releases in Chilton Mount Pilot National Park in northeast Victoria. Um, the bluish line uh, represents what is the, roughly the current range of the species. Uh, so the releases have been undertaken at that end of the range to try and stop the spread or, or, or the, the, the drop in range, so they're contracting to the north, uh, disappearing out of Victoria. When we release birds, we've been re releasing them wearing, them wearing radio transmitters, uh, and because we've gotten up to, a couple of years ago, a pretty big release with 101 birds, um, obviously we rely on volunteers to come and help us uh, track the fate of those birds once we've let them go. The monitoring is based on colour band reading, so every bird gets an individual combination of colour bands on their legs, but also radio tracking a, a proportion of the cohort that we release, generally about 50% of them. The transmitters that we use weigh 1.5 grams, so they're VHF transmitters that uh, Kat touched on a minute ago. We've used a couple of brands over the time we've run the project. We've mostly used Hollow Hill, which come from Canada. Uh, in 2015, we also tried uh, one Surtrack model. Uh, for people who don't know, they generally cost around $180 to $200 each. So by um, transmitter um, perspective, they're relatively cheap. Uh, the transmitters that we use last about 10 to 11 weeks. Uh, so we've got about three months of tracking time before those batteries go flat in those transmitters. So initially when we did the first release, we weren't really sure uh, how to stick them on even though we had trialled a backpack harness before. Um, but we trialled first in 2008, we did two uh, methods. So uh, one was a tail mounted transmitter setup, and the other one was a backpack harness. So this is uh, a couple of nights before we, we uh, released the birds. There's lots of prep doing tail-mounted transmitters, at least with the way we were taught. Uh, so we have uh, transverse holes through uh, the top and bottom of the transmitter where we glued dental floss uh, and then spent ages colour coding the dental floss different colours just so it was easier to stick them on. Um, so lots of super glue. I glued myself to myself and the table and transmitters and all sorts of stuff. Um, but we got taught by Mike Clark out of La Trobe University because they'd done that work with bell miners in the past. Uh, and so in the, the lower right image there, you can see um, once we'd... Um, so this was Mike training me how to stick the transmitters onto a dead bell miner that they'd culled previously. 
um, and you mount the transmitter at the base of the central couple of tail feathers, wrap the dental floss around and then apply super glue to hold it all in place. Uh, so that, that lower right image is us. We've plucked that out once we're done just to have a good look at, at how it sat, sits on. So 2008 release, we're sticking tail-mounted transmitters on half of the birds that we released that year. Uh, and as you can see there, my colleague Sarah, we've got a piece of cardboard underneath those couple of central tail feathers so we don't uh, liberally apply glue to every feather in the tail, um, but also um, a way to control the bird and control exactly what we're doing. It looks really neat when it's done. So there's a photo of one of the birds pretty much straight out of the holding aviaries. Uh, with a tail-mounted transmitter. We also used a backpack harness uh, and they have really complicated uh, materials that go into the construction. One millimetre hat elastic and linen cotton both purchased from Spotlight for probably three dollars. Um, so pretty high-tech stuff. Uh, <coughs> I end up with holes all over my fingers and thumbs in the lead-up because what we do because we want the transmitter to the, the harness to break and come off the bird, particularly uh, as as they have a, a limited lifespan, we don't want to have to catch them again. We sew a weak point into the harness, so um, I I thread the linen cotton through uh, the ends of two pieces of, of hat elastic, and then we tie them together with a knot. Uh, and the way we put it on the bird, that eventually degrades and breaks, uh, and then the the harness becomes loose, and the bird can preen it off. So the lower right image there is one half of, of, a trend, of, a, of a harness as I've prepared it. This is what it looks like, or this is what the, the, the version we used that year looked like. Uh, and you can see, um, if the mouse will work, is that showing? Uh, anyway, the top right hand side of the transmitter, you can see that's where the weak point is. So once that breaks, uh, the other side will fall out of the transmitter and the transmitter will come off the bird. Uh, that's a transmitter being fitted, so someone holding the bird while the other person attaches the transmitter. All of this is done inside a tent, so if we accidentally drop a bird, which we've done a couple of times, we don't want a bird to fly off into the sunset with a poorly fitted harness. If you look at the armpit of the bird once that transmitter is attached, um, that's what it looks like. So the harness material literally wrapped around the wing like this. And when the bird was out of the aviary uh, and ready to go again, that's what the finished product looks like. So pretty neat. Um, because we don't have solar panels, we're not fussed about feathers covering the transmitter. In actual fact, we want the feathers to cover the transmitter because it helps with aerodynamics and, and um, you know, not getting caught on anything. Uh, we have a, a 36 to 48 hour window where our birds are held in um, holding tents before we release them. Uh, it's just the way we, we run our releases. Um, we could, uh, now I'm pretty confident, well, certainly we redeploy these transmitters during the releases and we'll put the transmitter on and we'll let them go. Uh, but it does give these birds time to acclimatise. So that release, we compared what we got out of both transmitter attachment techniques. Um, we got some decent length in terms of times that the transmitters were stuck on the birds, but hopefully you can see at the bottom end of that scale, the tail-mounted tra transmitters, if they are going to prematurely fall off, they fell off really quickly. And in some cases, I, we saw birds shaking their tails to try and dislodge the, the transmitter. Uh, and in a couple of instances, um, birds flying with really bad aerodynamics, so like a tail dragging. So I wasn't a fan of it from the start. Uh, when we looked at the retention time, how long they were on the, the birds for, that the backpack harness worked better, so that was the method we, we stuck with. So fast forward to the 2010 release. We've decided that backpacks are the way to the go. We've got a method that worked. Um, this is where Ron Burgundy gives his warning uh, that we didn't quite have it right. And so very early in the 2010 release, we found a couple of birds like this. Um, <clears throat> we release birds from captivity, so there are some naive birds every time there's a level of predation that happens, that's to be expected, but finding a wholly intact bird lying face down on the ground is not great, particularly when the, you remove the harness and you can see uh, tissue embedded in one part of the harness material. 
And when you run a post-mortem, the way that the harness was fitted, it was a one-size-fits-all method that I'd inherited off someone else, uh, and obviously bird sizes vary. Uh, you have big birds and you have small birds. The small birds could get out of their harness really quickly, but the ones where we had big birds and a small harness, they're actually causing um, abrasion and tissue damage in the wings, which was leading to infection and death. So we went into adaptive management and we caught as many birds as we could over the coming weeks. Um, and I probably saw more Regent honey, honey eater armpits uh, than anyone really needs to in one lifetime. But in the process, we could work out that some birds were wearing that harness okay. Uh, in some instances, we had to remove them. So an example of one that we removed in the top row of images, you can see um, some abrasions underneath the, the armpits of the birds um, that had either broken skin or, or had broken it a little bit and healed. In this instance, we removed the harness from that bird. We recaptured that bird 49 days later as we were constantly catching and reassessing this. Uh, and thankfully, you can see that, that that bird had healed completely and was back to normal. Suffice to say, we went back to the drawing bird board on how we attached these transmitters. Um, and we tried a couple of different methods. Most of them have been discussed today. So uh, we tried leg loop harnesses on Regent honey eaters in captivity. Uh, we tried gluing transmitters on rather than using a harness at all. Uh, and then some idiot named Dean Ingleson tried a, a modified breast harness with a, a link here. But as you can see in that picture on the right, and someone I was talking to about yesterday, the way that design worked, we just had this loop of elastic that stuck out from the breast. So uh, even though we trialled it in captivity, um, none of them worked. Uh, the leg loop, because of the shape of a Regent honey eater, for some reason we just couldn't get the leg loops to stay on. Uh, the gluing transmitters didn't really work well, uh, and for the reasons I just discussed, uh, that, that modified backpack harness was pretty ugly too. So in 2012, um, we came upon the design that we uh, have used since. So the, the basic issue that we came up with, the, the thing that we needed to alleviate was taking that pressure off the leading edge of the wing uh, and, and taking the load off the wing. And all we needed to do was create a small alloy crimp um, to pull that elastic material onto the breast of the bird and take all of the load off the wings of the bird. So it's a couple of modified um, fishing uh, crimps. Uh, and as Grace said, we've got examples out there and I'm happy to show people what we, the materials and, and uh, what we use. Um, the, the other important thing, so it's not sewn in there, but in that picture where I've got number one, we still have a weak point sewn in, so the harness will break and it will come off the bird. At uh, point number two, uh, I feed material through the alloy crimp in opposite directions, and it's like doing up the belt on your pants. You can adjust it to the size of the individual bird. So rather than a one-size-fits-all, we've now got a method where you can custom fit every harness to every individual. Uh, and then we crimp it off with that alloy and it locks it into position. Uh, the harness itself, the crimps and the material weighs about 0.3 of a gram. Um, and so we're well under the, the um, magical 5% limit uh, for most of our Regent honey eaters. And as I say there, um, I've now got to the point where I can fit a harness like that in about five minutes to a Regent honey eater. There will be, I'm not sure when we're going to put it up, but I have a five minute video of me. We, we took a video of me actually fitting a harness. So um, it'll be either outside or playing in a break uh, today where you can actually watch, watch me fitting one of these transmitters. Um, this is a pretty horrid graph, but we did collect data while we were doing these trials uh, at Taronga Zoo. Um, so again, having someone there as a holder while I'm fitting the transmitter, um, so if someone's got control of the bird uh, and we use alligator clips, we use a, f a couple of tricky little things just to help us fit the transmitter and the harness as we go. But what you can see there top left is a bird wearing a transmitter and it's been in the field for a few days. Um, you can't actually see the harness material or the crimp or anything, it's preened completely within the, the plumage of the bird. Um, the lower left image, I'm, I'm blowing 
uh, on the front of the bird to get the feathers out of the way to expose it. And you can see that they preen it right down uh, almost to skin level. Uh, and again, the, the image on the right uh, shows the transmitter body itself on the back of the bird all neatly covered with feathers. One thing that we have done, which I desperately need to publish, is because of the issue in 2010, we were catching and assessing birds, we were weighing them every time. So using weight as a gross measure of health of the bird post-release and the impact of wearing a transmitter, uh, the blue bars there are birds, the, the change in weight from pre-release weight uh, for birds fitted with transmitters, uh, and the green bars are for the birds that are never fitted with transmitters. So while we're misnetting and capturing birds wearing transmitters, we also uh, capture birds that are banded only and not wearing transmitters. But you can see across uh, all four releases that we've been recapturing birds, um, there's been no difference in the, the weight change uh, between the two cohorts, uh, which is uh, at least some positive reinforcement that there doesn't appear to be an enormous cost of these birds carrying these transmitters. I'll talk more in my next section uh, in terms of the data that we get out of the, the tracking that we do, but the main reason for us monitoring these birds with transmitters is just to see how many survive. By releasing naive birds back into the wild, um, it, it's really about how, how well do they survive in the environment, uh, how many do we lose, um, a little bit of movement stuff. Uh, but we have benchmarks that we want to achieve, you know, X number of birds um, being found. Now, on the left, it says minimum survival. There's a detectability um, component to this graph as well. So banded-only birds that aren't wearing transmitters that decide our release site's no good and they go somewhere else. Uh, so this is sort of the minimum survival. Um, there's the de detectability in that too. Uh, but we get to create, um, you know, graphs like this, which I'll talk to more uh, but this is an enormous amount of effort that goes into this. As Kat said, with VHF um, beeping transmitters, this is hand, uh, uh, foot and car base tracking uh, by hundreds of people and in an average release will collect five to 6,000 waypoints. Um, so there's a massive amount of work that goes into collecting these data. Uh, and I'll just finish with the last couple of slides. Um, the backpack harness that we've used uh, is applicable for other species, as um, was mentioned in the previous talks as well, but there's a poster up in the foyer, uh, Rowan Clark and myself uh, and a couple of others. Uh, we've trialled attaching uh, the 5 gram microwave telemetry satellite transmitters to princess parrots in captivity. Uh, and what we showed was the first couple of days their behaviours will change a bit. They preen them, they play around with them a bit more. Uh, but after that, behaviour largely goes back to normal and, and, again, there's no discernible change in weight between birds fitted with transmitters and those without. Uh, in terms of what we want to try and achieve now with Regent Honeyeaters, microwave telemetry have a 2-gram um, solar satellite transmitter uh, that I've got uh, five of at the moment. Um, is anyone here from microwave telemetry by any chance? They actually arrived slightly heavier than they said they were going to, which meant that my um, elastic harness that I'd perfected over eight years or four captive releases uh, is too heavy. Uh, so we've had to go back to the drawing board on harness so we know where a bird can wear this transmitter or wear a transmitter really well, uh, but we've had to go back to basics and redesign the material. So what we've got at the moment is a 3D printed plastic harness uh, which um, gets me in a circuit back to my initial contact with Grace. Uh, and the, the basic model for this comes from a, a Cornell researcher looking at sandalings in North America. Uh, so a, a mate of mine and I, we've been playing with printing these um, harnesses. And uh, again, there's demo versions of, of the um, harness and also so the, 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 the harness material, but also fitted to a couple of birds in the, um, in the foyer. Here's Reggie, my stuffed Regent honey eater at home, um, showing it off on the, the, the fashion catwalk. Um, so I've sized it on a stuffed bird and based on experience uh, with uh, lots of tracking of, of Regent honey eaters post-release. Um, and the way at the moment I've got the harness material or the 3D printed material being held in place 
uh, is heat shrinked um, tubing from electrical uh, work um, and then super glue, some gel super glue. Uh, so it works really well on a stuffed bird sitting in my study. Um, and in the coming weeks, we're going to trial it again uh, on captive birds at Taronga Zoo. Um, so heaps of project partners, um, but I guess it's a, a word of caution. Um, be really careful about how you're sticking your transmitters on uh, and um, be aware of you know, potential un unintended consequences from, from harness attachment techniques. Done. <laughs> you, you were 20 seconds under. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Good work. So just while Amanda's getting the um, next talk, who is? <laughs> Ken Gosball. Ken. Um, so people that actually used harness, leg loop wing harness, can you just raise your hands so that we can see? Okay, have a look around, anyone that's interested in wing harnesses. These are some of the people. I don't expect you, but um, see if you can remember to talk to these people if you are interested. And again, you know, there's, there's props to help you use in the foyer. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to talk just for a few moments about geolocators and their attachment. Uh, there's a lot more, of course, we can say about geolocators, but we'll save that for another time. But just to sort of indicate that the VWSG and AWSG of, uh, and QWSG have used geolocators over a number of years now. Uh, we're into our 10th year of using them. Uh, and we've actually uh, deployed over a thousand geolocators on nine species of birds. So we have a little experience uh, of using these instruments, uh, these loggers, uh, at, with some excellent success. Uh, the attachment is, is really pretty simple. Uh, while in the first year we did try one or two different ways of attaching, for the last nine years, ten years, we have used leg loop. Uh, le leg loop. I'm, I'm, I'm too many people. Uh, leg, uh, leg flag uh, mountings, and uh, that's that's just a typical uh, attachment. They've been attached, as I say, to uh, all the time to shorebirds, migratory shorebirds, uh, and the bulk of the. Uh, Attach, uh, the bulk of the uh, deployment has been on ruddy turnstones where uh, we have worked with them in, uh, in three states uh, of Australia. Uh, and we've used, uh, over the last nine years, Integio geolocators. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I should say over the last uh, six years we've used Integios. Uh, before that we, we used uh, a range of other geolocators but uh, we have had very good success with the Integio locators supplied by Migrate Technology, uh, and we u universally use them now. Uh, these are 0.65 grams in weight. And when you add them onto the leg flag, it's 1.1 grams, uh, so, and the birds carry these very well, the ones that we've used. So this is uh, attached to a specially formed leg flag, uh, with, with uh, Kevlar, which I'll show you in a moment. So the, the mounting process really is fairly straightforward. Uh, firstly, you, you form a leg flag uh, out of Darvik or, or similar material. Uh, it has a, an upstand on the outside of the leg flag. You drill holes that uh, take the ties and then you mount the, the geolocator in the saddle that, that's formed with that, uh, with, with just with Araldite. And you use the ties, which are Kevlar ties, and that's fairly important that uh, it's very, very high strength material, uh, which uh, we, we've used with, with uh, great success. So that, those Kevlar ties are, uh, securely tie that geolocator to the leg flag and then you apply a coating of araldite uh, to the ties uh, just to, to protect and, uh, and secure it. But, of course, you must make sure that there's uh, 
no material that's covering the light sensor, which is the key to these loggers. So uh, the, the uh, leg flag is then attached to the leg of the bird when it's, when it's captured. And I might say that uh, over the last uh, couple of years, we have now also used a 0.3 gram geolocator, uh, which is supplied by my great technology, and we've used those on redneck stints uh, with uh, quite a deal of success. So uh, the, the, the weight of these is, uh, is coming down all the time. Of course, uh, it's not just the fact of, of sticking them on. Uh, you've got to have the right mode uh, selected for the geolocator. Uh, and I'll just very briefly mention that because people do get a little confused by that sometimes. Uh, we certainly use full light value, full light range, and not a truncated light range. That is very important if you want to uh, uh, find out things like um, breeding areas in the Arctic and so on. Uh, we have a full conductivity record so that you know when the bird is uh, flying and when it's in seawater. Uh, and then you have a temperature record which helps us with uh, incubation characteristics. The battery life uh, is normally from 16 months for the, uh, uh, the, the 0.65 gram ones to six months for the three gram, 0.3 gram ones. Uh, and just to show they do survive, uh, the, uh, that's a photo taken only about six weeks ago uh, in the Yellow Sea of one of our ruddy turnstone with carrying a, uh, a geolocator. Thanks. Anytime during the week. Anyone else had experience with geolocators? There you go. Okay, we will have the nine sound of the next three as well, but just give me an idea. Okay. Next we have Rowan Mott. Mm-hmm. With uh, tail. Tape mounting. Tape mounting. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about sticking devices onto birds with tester tape. Uh, it's it looks a lot like duct tape, um, but it's got a couple of um, differences. It's actually a cloth tape, um, so it's got a lot less stretch in it than um, duct tape, and you can tear it in the field, so it, um, that's, it's really handy. Um, when you go on the Tessa Tape website, there are a couple of, uh, well, a multitude of different um, products that they sell, and most papers just say Tessa Tape. Um, so, but this is the, um, the product that you're going for and a couple of links there. Um, I can email them to anyone uh, after the talk if they want to know um, what, what we've used. So the work that I've done tessitaping birds to, uh, tags to birds um, was during my PhD on seabirds. We've stuck these onto um, frigate birds, boobies and tropic birds in yeah, tropical environments uh, and where they get wet as well in seawater, so quite um, harsh environments and we've had um, yeah, really good tag retention. Um, the uh, short-term deployments during the breeding season, so um, uh, yeah, trying to catch the bird back about 12 days later, um, but the, we have had ones that uh, we haven't been able to catch them back on one trip to the island uh, and the, the tag um, we've found shed with the feathers still attached when it's molted um, in the non-breeding season. So um, there's indication that this lasts a, a very long time um, even in, in the harsh marine conditions. So this is um, our typical setup. Um, we have uh, uh, the bottom that one there must have got distracted by a firework last night and moved the um, text box. But um, this is our typical setup. We have uh, a, a, just a kitchen cutting board with uh, several strips of um, tesser tapes um, aligned down it. Um, and they're individually cut with a, a ruler and Stanley knife before we go into the field into about seven millimetre wide um, strips. Uh, and 
the length there is actually cut in half um, so that the length that we put on the bird is about um, yeah 150 percent of the circumference of the GPS logger. If you go any longer than that, it becomes really hard to um, yeah fold them um, back under themselves. So essentially, we're tail mounting these. So you grab the um, we were mounting them to four central tail feathers, and the aim is to place it as close to the base of those tail feathers as possible so there's not um, any scope for flapping um, of, the, of the feathers. Uh, we also um, stuck a, a loop of tesser tape onto the back of the logger so that it formed a double-sided um, little, little loop uh, and that just helps hold it in place once we've got those feathers isolated um, and we've got the logger in place. Then uh, you can slide the the cutting board in under the feathers to help um, keep other feathers out of the way. Uh, peel off a strand of tesser tape um, and then it works best if you fit the, um, the end closest to the tail tip first, it just makes it easier. So you're um, sliding the tesser tape under those isolated tail feathers and wrapping one side over and then the other so you end up like, yeah, it's tucked into a, a little blanket. Um, and one key thing, uh, if you stick the, um, the double-sided loop of tesser tape onto the underside of the GPS logger, um, sometimes for seabird work, you'll put them in a heat shrinking tubing and it can be um, difficult to tell in the field what is the upper and underside. Um, so if you can mark when you're sealing them, the upper side, you'll get um, better um, satellite reception if the um, transmitter is oriented up ways rather than being accidentally put on upside down on the bird. Another way that um, I've been involved with but um, a lot less uh, involvement is um, back mounting. Um, this is um, from P little penguins at um, Phillip Island and as you can see you've got a, a upwards facing bit of tesser tape with a sticky side up. You just get a, a pinch of feathers on the back uh, and you can um, tab the, um, the, the, stick the tesser tape to your two fingers and just slide it in under and let go of the pinch of feathers and the same with the, that until you've got a, um, a bed of, a bed of tesser tape. Uh, then you just put your GPS tracking device or your um, accelerometer onto that bed and fold the blankets over. Um, there's a really good YouTube video of people feeding it to an Inca turn uh, in South America. The, um, the, that's the YouTube link to that if you want to see that um, a video of that um, and yeah and again I can email you um, links to that if that's something you're interested and that's all oh, the, oh sorry yeah um, a couple of things um, pre pre flight checks um, yeah it can be um, difficult to um, ma make sure that feathers aren't pinned so yeah just that the bird can fly. Um, that its preen gland is still accessible and uh, that you haven't accidentally twisted a loop of tesser tape, one of the little thin ones, so that um, the bird can stick itself to it at a later date. Um, and then when removing the logger, uh, if you peel away towards the, the feather tips, um, it's a much, um, that leaves the feather structure intact a lot better. Um, and then just rubbing the feather between your fingers just a little bit just to remove any residual stickiness um, will, it will help to ensure that there's no later sticking. Thanks. Excellent. You. Thanks, Rowan. Okay, while Amanda gets her talk ready, um, taping. Taping, taping, taping. Now, I have got sorry, some um, shorebird skins out there that I am going to sac sacrifice to. One... Um, for glue on, mm -hmm. and Amanda will have a session um, during the week at a mutual time. And Rowan, I've just decided that you'll have a session too, is, if that's okay. Now, <laughs> if you want to be part of that session um, to actually see Rowan do it, and, and the other taping people, please come as well to have your input, and same as the glue on, um, speak to Amanda or Rowan as the coordinators and, and decide on a mutual time because yeah, during the week, and we'll do that, okay? Amanda, your turn. Thank you. Thanks. So I don't have a presentation, um, but as Grace has said, we're going to do uh, a live demo 
on a dead bird that we will sacrifice um, some feathers. So essentially with uh, the glue-on tagging uh, method, has anybody done a glue-on of VHF tags? Yep. So there's a couple of people in the room. So that's, that's really great. We'll, we'll um, probably get as many people around for the um, demonstration session. But essentially, I just learnt it um, from Denny Rogers on shorebirds to um, find exactly where you like to put the, the tag on the bird's back. And for shorebirds, it's slightly on the, on the flat back part above the preening gland and then trimming those feathers and gluing that tag on, making sure um, to not get the, the glue anywhere else, especially the flight feathers. Um, and so what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll do that trimming demonstration in person. So if anybody's keen, we'll set up a time, probably at morning tea today might be the best time. Yep. So we can, we can uh, do that soon. So we've, we've got um, one last quick talk and then morning tea's at 10.15. So um, we're going well for time. And um, I don't know if it was mentioned before, but there's geolocators down here. And also, it's a really good opportunity to chat at morning tea and at lunch with um, anybody that you've heard from today, particularly our sponsors that are here to provide products to us and also solutions to all of our tracking needs. So make sure you find these people and, and stop by the, the Tag Talk station that Grace and Dean have set up out the front. And, uh, and now Grace is going to chat about the... Um, ethical and welfare considerations for bird tracking. Okay, ethical and welfare considerations. All right. Um, it's, it's all fairly basic, but uh, you'll find under a, a stressful situation of actually putting these trackers on birds that you do make mistakes, you forget things. So um, we'll just start with, you know, you work out your project, you choose a, a tag that suits your project. Pretty simple. There's a heap around. We've got people to talk to today. Um, that's all I'll say about that. Attachment method. I always like to think that we'll go for the least invasive method. I find the harnesses invasive and problematic, but um, if you've got a tag that's going to last you three, four weeks, and you, you only need three, four weeks of data, you know, try to go for a, for a short-term solution um, and a longer-term solution, for instance, um, shorebirds, um, we, you'd go for a suitable harness, but you need to research those harnesses. Captive trials, trials where possible. Not always possible, but as you heard Dean say, um, um, with the captive breeding, release and translocation birds and rehab birds that people have done, um, you know, you can put them on ahead of time to make sure the bird's okay, which is a real luxury and a really good way to learn. Be prepared. Okay, when it comes to time, be prepared. Have everything ready. Don't say, oh, if we catch the birds, we'll set up. Just have everything ready. Um, um, pretty basic stuff. Minimise stress for the bird mainly, but also for yourself so you don't make mistakes. So um, set up and, enfor and enforce a quiet, calm, controlled area. Allocate your duties to, to the members of your team. And no sudden movement or noise is one of those things. They've actually done studies on lab animals where sudden noises cause more stress to lab animals than sort of a constant noise. But, you, you know, in the field in particular, you might have people shouting and you just need to control the situation, okay? You don't want your birds... Um, especially your susceptible birds getting capture myopathy. You've got to minimise the chance of capture myopathy and, and, and any, any of that sort of uh, problem. Uh, again, reducing handling time to reduce stress, not a time to train people to um, band and flag birds, for instance. You get experienced people, you get things done, you get the tracking device on. Um, know your species so you know how they behave, how they walk. Um, their stress limits, even in shorebirds, red knots, wimbrel, um, stressy birds, We've got to be careful. We've got to really be careful in what we do. Um, and as we've found out, and you'll hear during the conference, Orion Pratt and Coles, they've got real guts. They're just uh, fighters and they've done really well. So, you know, the, the bird's personality may have something to do with their sex, success in tracking. Post-fitting. Dean thankfully talked about um, holding cages. So consider, consider um, a holding cage so when you put your tracking on the bird that you can um, hold them and observe to get the fitting right. We do this with shorebirds. I like the soft shade cloth cages where 
if they panic and flap around, they won't hurt themselves. I, I'm not a big fan of the dog cages, the plastic. I, I just don't like if birds panic and hit the sides. I, I, I'm not. A, this is my personal thing. Now, so you fit your ca uh, fit your uh, tag, you place it in the cage. You know, eastern curlew. You've got to make sure it's tall enough so they can stand. You, I know what a eastern curlew. I know what my shorebirds sort of look like. I know that they need to stand tall. I know if they're sitting down, they won't get up. I may have put the leg loop harness a little bit tight, and I will adjust. Can take 20 minute time. It takes depends on experience. But for leg loop harnesses, for instance, um, they can be in that keeping cage for about 20 minutes sometimes. And, um, and, and all the time, I'm looking for the nice posture. Are they walking? No lameness. Are their feet okay when they're walking? Wings held evenly. Um, alert and then look out for extra sign of stress. This is important because you're often under pressure to get these tags on and release. If you're in doubt, and this is, I learnt the hard way, if you are in doubt and like, oh, I don't know, doesn't matter what anyone else says, you say, no, nope, this tag's coming off, we'll do another catch, we'll save this tag. Because we use MTI tags, you know, about 5,000 Australian dollars each. Um, cut it off, use it later, instead of this one case where I wasn't sure, but I, I felt the pressure from myself and outside and let the bird go. Lasted one day, got to Robot Plains and that was the last we heard of this tag. So I don't know what I don't know what happened, but that's really I find that really important. Now, I didn't get time to go through this. Now the three percent, five percent body weight rule is slowly going out the window. Not to say we can put heavy trackers on birds, but there are so many other things. Professor Rory Wilson, Swansea University, um, has made a PowerPoint which is available online but I will write to him, make it available on the Google Drive where you'll get post um, information post-workshop. Um, and he goes through all sorts of things and things I've only just learnt uh, regarding the pressure points and the, and the effect on the flags and thermoregulation, which you can imagine is really important in, in shorebirds um, breeding in the Arctic. So that's a really good one to have a look. And I'm going to ask Professor Wilson whether he's, we can use his email address for questions and other papers he may have written. But I found that really interesting. Okay, learn, no, judgment-free zone. Learn from your mistakes, learn from other people's mistakes. Like Dean, I was happy to show you slides. Learn so we can just move ahead quicker instead of making the same mistakes, yeah? Um, and, and try, like, let's, let's keep the politics and the judgment out of, oh God, that, you know, it's crap project, crap, crap research. Just, let's just learn. Uh oh. Okay, quickly wanted to show you a session of things that we can learn. Just a couple of slides. Eastern curlew. In this case, I've removed any identifications, but in this case, a long legged bird is very suitable for a leg loop harness. In this case, this organisation decided to use a wing harness. Was obviously. Um, I mean, it is, I guess it's possible, but generally with long-billed birds, we keep away from wing harnesses. But he, it actually wasn't put on properly, tried to preem, and this is how it was found. It was in China somewhere, this is how it was found. Now, unless that bird was caught up, that's, that's a dead bird. Um, there's there's no, no recovering from that. Teflon in the mouth, okay? So, you know, importance of understanding your attachment methods. This other one, this was really interesting because this, the researcher had done a lot of work in captive trials and she used uh, jewellery wire, elastic sort of jewellery, plasticky type wire, and she braided a really fancy looking attached um, harness and it looked really good. The idea was this harness with its jewellery wire would start breaking and that would be the weak link. Trouble was, because it was sort of like plaited and braided, bits of harness, uh, bits of the jewellery wire, not all at once. And what happened was, in two cases, I actually photographed birds in this where the, where the tags moved um, to the side. So it didn't sort of come off, didn't come off it like readily. Um, one of those birds was actually found by a member of the public with the bill stuck in that um, thing and, and subsequently died. So when you're considering your weak links, do your, do your homework about if it breaks there, how does it fall off? So, the person responsible for this, she stopped using the jewellery wire because it was a good idea and she thought it was going to work, but because it was just too slow um, and just loosened, this is what happens. Finally, again, I'm going to say it again, talk to each other. Let's move forward by learning from each other. That's it.
Thanks, Grace. Uh, and so we'll break for morning tea now, just a really quick break, 15 minutes, uh, and then straight, straight back into it. Uh, so there should be food, snacks outside, and if you do want a coffee or tea, uh, just down at the cafe, just 15 metres away.
Wow, so next to that, I you've got it. Do need to come to me in the so we need to come back some time to I could bring you one back if you need it. Some longer and some longer. Yeah, Yeah, but I would like to try and do something. You've got feedback for you. Then. You can read them. There's nothing expressly okay, negative in the comments that they're going to write. I have to have my rejoinder in. No, no, no. Just, just generally. So. There, uh, two of them say nothing negative at all, just okay. positive comments, yeah. and one of them is asked for a whole lot of tiny things. How are you yeah. going to bleed them? Are you going to need some tasks? But also lots of positive things. Yeah. Um, it might happen. It might not. Yeah, happen. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, anyways, but there's nothing, nothing like. Are they really positive about the project is on and many positive about that? Yeah. Many. Yeah. So, yeah. So, okay. so that so but that hurdle has been taken and was passed over. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And and hello, hi. hello, hello. How are you? Hello to this man. Good day to see you again. How are you these days? Hi. Oh well? Yeah. You still get on the really good? Um some. More bigger. <laughs> you can't get rid of the seagull, is it? Oh, given that there is absolutely nothing positive about anything you know. It's a great feel, yes? Sorry? Brilliant so far. Yeah, except they've got them all into the house. And you haven't what? brought them all into the house. Oh, they don't have that. It doesn't matter. Everybody uh, is really inspired. Mm. Mm. It's really good. And also the program that we have with them. Do the islands in my day of good work? Ah, uh, but uh, in Bulgaria, we had them. Mm, thank you. Thank you. I was about to say, but we better go on screen now.
57 thirds where we've got two or more effects on the same bird. Yeah, but some people have Someone said they would, don't worry. Okay. You better look after yourself. There's nothing in here, don't sit. No, further afield, someone may bring one. I may be lucky in not. When did you get here? Uh, I'm putting it on oh, now. Sorry. I'm just looking for it. I think, shit, I wonder what I do with it. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> so I put, I, I'm just, which one is it? It must be this one, 3 Minutes Radio Trekking Geelong. Yeah, that's the one, Geelong. Okay. 
So, um, I don't know. 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 The caterer just showed up. Oh, thank you. That's sweet. I
Sorry about that delay with uh, the morning tea delivery, but hopefully everybody's got something to eat, bit of a sugar hit, and we'll get back into the next part of the session. Uh, before we move on to the data collection, mapping, and analysis discussion, we'll go. We'll just go quickly into Neil Hamilton's talk. If Neil could come up to the front, please, and. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. I was just talking to Amanda, and a few years ago at Geelong Conference, I gave this presentation on elastic band harnessing. And 10 years ago, we did a lot of work in Woodvale Wildlife Research. That's where I'm from in, in WA. And over this time, we've been working um, on various techniques, like everyone else in this room. And those that were at Geelong would have seen this presentation, so apologise, but uh, I think it's probably important for today. Everybody else is around. So what we came up with was a normal elastic band on the table, just on your desk. And this elastic band, as you know, is quite durable, soft, etc. And years ago, I worked with John Wanowski on releasing um, buff band of rails on, from North Kelling to Cocos Island. I mean, this trial went really well for VHF, and there's a paper written on that, as everyone knows. So basically, with the normal glue, as you can see the pictures up there, all we're doing is just using straight elastic bands, as you see the way it's designed there. Tail mounts failed on ground parrots. The idea was to get the scrub birds organised down the southwest. We also only had two days of data, and Sarah's here today, she can talk more about that. So we're getting up a month on the scrub birds. And from there, rails were three or four months. So whatever information you want to get, over time, the elastic band drops off. As you can see, I won't go all through because I've only got a couple of minutes. You can talk to me later. There are all the birds that have been trialled. There's more to be done. Recently, the ground parrots just had them on. You can talk to Sarah about that. They were for night parrots and ground parrots, but ground parrots, I believe, have been pretty successful. All the trials were done in captivity. Mulga parrots, similar to uh, ground parrots, made a big difference for the, uh, the work on the ground parrots, which is fantastic. Tegan Douglas in the room, you can talk to her about it with her work. I think that's about it. It's just a two-minute spiel, but if you want to talk about it, I'll put some examples out the front. Thank you very much. Uh, so that's Neil and Sarah. Can you put your hand up? There we go. And Tegan, where are you? So anyone back there? There you go. And um, starting our next session, we've got Robert Bush, and he'll give us an overview from data collection to mapping movements of uh, tagged birds. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks very much. So we've uh, moved on now and we've got um, uh, a bird with some device on it and uh, it's sending us some data and I'm going to use a case example um, of uh, data going through the Argus system uh, and uh, to take you from, uh, from the data up until mapping and then on into some, a couple of other uh, questions. And there are a lot of ways of doing this. Um, I've tried to reach a point somewhere between um, more complicated algorithms and um, basic uh, point and click on a, on a screen to give you a, an idea about what's uh, possible. 
Uh, I just need to acknowledge uh, Brad uh, Woodworth and uh, John Coleman, who um, uh, the three of us uh, managed this kind of data in, in, um, in, uh, in Queensland. This is what I'm going to do. Um, first of all, um, how I'm going to address how positioning data in this particular system uh, is collected from a satellite uh, using a platform terminal transmitter. That's important because there are certain errors in it and we need to take that into account. And then we're going to take that data and uh, prepare it and, uh, for a map then place it on a map and then I'm going to look at some behavioral ecology that we might be able to pick up from that map and then to ask some more interesting uh, and more advanced analytical questions. A lot of this work is quite descriptive. People put things on maps, but there's a lot we could do to move that on a bit into some more analytical stuff. I'm not actually going to do that today. I'm just going to talk about the possibilities. So this is the case study. It's uh, Eastern Curlew, AAJ. Um, it's um, a sub-adult, and it was... Um, uh, had its transmitter attached on the 3rd of March in 2018. It's never gone uh, back up to northern China or into southern parts of Russia. Um, it's in its second year now. It might stay, it might go next year. It might even stay for three years. Um, it's got a device, a tracking device. Um, hold on to this number, 40964. Uh, and that's the, in a sense, its call sign that we're able to uh, identify it amongst all the other birds that we have tagged and tracked. Uh, it's been signaling now from, uh, from March uh, last year, so um, about uh, 15, 15 months so far, and uh, it's remained pretty much in the same place ever since. So just to start uh, with a little bit of um, kind of uh, issues about, about the way these, the system works, this um, particular Argus system uses uh, 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 a Doppler system, that is, that it uh, tracks or determines where a bird is uh, using radio waves um, rather than a standard form of trigonometry. And it works very simply like this, that if you have a bird that's sending a signal and you have a receiver, in this case a satellite, and they're, in, they're both exactly static and they don't move, then a radio wave is of a constant uh, length between the two places. And you can measure the length of that radio wave. As the two move apart, the radio waves increase in length, and you can measure that. And as they come closer, the radio wave gets shorter. And since you know the length of these different radio waves, you can calculate, believe me, you can calculate the distance between uh, where you're receiving something and where, you are, where the bird was sending it. So you're using radio wave lengths uh, as part of the process to determine uh, where the bird is. And this, is, um, uh, this has a certain amount of error in it, and so I'm telling you this story because we need to determine the issue of the error. Here is a picture on the, of a 5 gram microwave telemetry um, uh, TT platform terminal transmitter on a Coke, uh, Kirk's lemonade can being tested. Um, there's a good way of doing it. The cans are quite heavy. They don't get blow over. But the real picture is on the side. You see the red arrow is the satellite passing through the sky. Uh, and you'll see two tagged birds, one at about 30 degrees north and the other near the equator. And you'll see um, a dotted line, a signal going from the tagged birth at 30 degrees north to a satellite, and then another one a little bit further along. And so you can measure those two radio waves. And as the satellite goes along, it goes at a certain speed, at a certain trajectory, so you know where it is. So you've essentially got enough information to be able to determine where that bird is. But clearly, there's a certain amount of movement uh, in all of this. Um, radio waves are also subject to um, magnetic field inf uh, uh, interference. So um, uh, you need to collect a number of these particular points and then to estimate where the bird is as best you can. So that's uh, the story about the collecting of the information. And that information, if you're, uh, this, we're using um, uh, the Argus system. Uh, we've paid our money and we've been given a username and a password and we can go in and collect our data and begin to do something for it. And you can see the, um, uh, 
URL for the forum for going in and collecting the data. Now, when you collect this data, um, you're going to uh, have to decide what you're going to do. We have quite a lot of birds sitting in here in this database. So the first thing we're going to do is um, I need to move over out here because I can't. Oh, I suppose I could see, but then I can't see the point. Right. Okay. So um, the first thing we need to do is determine what data we want to extract. There's that number four zero. 964, that's the bird. So let's call up, let's call up the, um, let's call up this bird and we'll get all the data for that bird. Then we need to decide, are we going to just get the, all of the data? Remember, a lot of it's inaccurate. Or are we going to choose some data? Well, I'm going to choose to get all of the data. I'm going to do that now because I want to take the data out of this system into my own system and use all sorts of other programs to manipulate that data. And I don't want to select it at this stage. But the normal process is that you would probably select it. These numbers here and letters are an indication of how accurate that each signal is. And um, just to show you that. So here's a table of accuracy. GPS, uh, which we're not using, is accurate to within 100 meters. But you'll see within this system that uses the Doppler effect, different levels of accuracy. Three is the most accurate, two and one, and then zero and AB are basically uh, rubbish. Uh, so uh, each of these signals has got a code against it to tell us, um, and based on a basic estimate, uh, uh, estimate sort of criteria, as to how accurate it is. We're now going to have to decide um, what, uh, what time period. And I've chosen a time period. This is real-time data, so to speak, from the beginning of this year till the 25th until last week. Um, you can see that uh, last-minute preparation for this talk. And, um, uh, and then having decided on that, I'm going to search for it, and here's a, uh, the data at the bottom. You can see there's our bird. What's important to suggest, these are not individual birds. These are all data pings. So because I want to do lots of things with this data, I'm going to take it out of the Argus system. You could keep it in the Argus system and draw maps with it, do all sorts of things with it, because I want to do other kind of more interesting things with it. Well, not, it depends. I don't want to put Argus down, but it, wants, it may want to do things that Argus can't do with it, and I may want to share it with my colleagues and so on. So we have to take it out, and we have to take it out in some format. So CSV, uh, comma, separated variables is the common way of doing that. It's a very simple sort of system. You've got a piece of data, let's say the bird's ID, comma, longitude, comma, latitude, comma, quality of data, comma, and so on. And you can then upload that into Excel, into all sorts of spreadsheets. But because we're going to map it, I'm actually going to take it out as uh, KML, which is a particular way of setting data up so that it can be used in a mapping program, and particularly uh, first used in Google Earth. Well, here is, um, here is the uh, data that we've extracted. Uh, don't worry about it if you get confused by lots of data. Here we've got the number. So all of the pings. For the last uh, six months, every single one is there. This is just a whole lot of information about when the data signal came along. But here's the, la the, the last piece of data we've got, the 23rd, the 6th of the 23rd. Remember that I chose the 25th. And that's because the transmitter, uh, we're having 12 hours off, 36 hours, 12 hours on, 36 hours off for it to charge up. So the, at the the date that I chose, it was actually charging up. This is the last data point it sent, and it's at uh, 6.31 minutes, 31 seconds, 6.31, 10 o'clock at night on the 23rd. And there's its longitude and latitude, okay? And it goes all the way down for a long period of time. Now, if I went along that data sheet, I would come across uh, a list here right on the edge of this screen of the quality. So that last data point here is a three. Remember the three, that's as accurate as it gets on this one within about a 200 uh, meter accuracy. Uh, one is 
uh, not quite as accurate. Zero, B, B, A, B, quite a lot of them are a lot of well rubbish. But uh, I remember I didn't decide to clear it up because I may want to investigate all of that later on. But at the moment, we've got this data. So now let's decide that we're going to map it and take it to Google Maps. I've downloaded it onto my screen. I've called up um, Google Earth, and I'm importing now this data as a KLM file into, um, into Google Maps. Uh, and it's going to map my data. And there it is. Just to orientate you, this is Brisbane. This is Moreton Bay. This is the southern part of Moreton Bay. That's North Stradbroke Island and Moreton Island. And you can see that there are lots of little dot points. These are all the data pings and lots of lines between them. I can do lots of things here. I can remove the lines and just have the dot points. I make them bigger. I can change the color, whatever. It's a bit confusing, but it's quite clear that this bird has been living for um, the last six months in the southern part of Moreton Bay. But remember that quite a lot of this data, or some of this data, is inaccurate. I don't know why it would want to go flying out into the Pacific. And did it really go up towards the center of Brisbane? Uh, or go for a holiday up to Morton Island on one occasion? So let's um, begin to look on these. We can click on these and have a look and see what we've got. Do we need to remove them? I've... Um, what you'll see here is there's our bird, there's its Latin long. This is the uh, data point at um, uh, seven, uh, just after nearly eight minutes past uh, nine o'clock on the, on the 23rd. So one of the slightly earlier data points, if you remember it, it was a bee. There it is. There apparently is where it was, but this is rubbish. So we'll click it off and get rid of it. So we can clean it up now. We can go to a number of data points. Did it really go up here? Did it really go down towards the center of Brisbane? We can clear it up visually. We could have done it another way, but let's do it this way for the sake of demonstration. And so when we do that, we end up with a more accurate picture. I forgot to remove these. These are not accurate. But actually, it did go for a holiday up here. It did actually go up that way. And interestingly, it went to a wetland towards the center of the city of Brisbane for some reason on a couple of occasions. So now we can begin to look at this and see what, we, what, sort of, what have we got that's interesting here. Well, it goes a lot to this place here that happens to be Jeff Skinner. It goes uh, reserve. It tends to go to just south of Dunwich, to this, these mud flats here. It goes to here. It goes here quite a lot. And it goes this area of mud flats down here and actually that area there. So what we could do is begin to uh, repeat this exercise now. Now we've got our data points mostly cleaned up. We could begin to look at uh, and see what's happening in terms of how this bird is um, behaving. We just repeat it. I'm not going to repeat it all. It would take too long, but let's have a look here. So we could look at uh, what's happening at different tide heights. We could look at day and night. We could look at summer and winter, summer when the 350-odd other eastern curlew in the flock are there, come back from breeding. We can look at it during weather patterns. We can load in uh, disturbance patterns, and we can get a sort of picture. And this is the picture that we get. It has two feeding sites, this one on the mudflat south of Dunwich, and this area between Kuti Mudjo and Maclay Island, uh, a very large mudflat area. It has two mainly daytime and occasionally nighttime roosting areas, the Toondah Harbour sand flats and the uh, Jeff Skinner area. It tends to roost there and go here. But when it's nighttime, it goes to here, very close by to Peel Island. It also, although there are not quite so many dots here, because when we get uh, spring tides or more, more, most spring tides, but certainly king tides, this is covered, and it will then move off here. It also uses this, because we looked at the timing, as a sort of staging post. It's not here. It's here about sometimes about three hours before. It moves between these two sites, and it moves down here, but it uses this. This is its world, if you like. For some unknown reason, it actually did go into the center of Brisbane, apparently, according to this data, on a couple of occasions. But this is the world it's in. Now, I just want to, um, because I'm 
occasionally rather radical about things, do something else. There's a, a square. And this is, um, if you were watching Four Corners um, the other week, this is the Tunda Harbour development. This is the area of the Ramsar site proposed for extinction for the building of 3,600 units. Uh, and you can see it's right on the edge of the, one of the two main roosting sites. If I then take the developer's submission to the Commonwealth Department of Environment, the area to be disturbed for 20 years, that is the area to be disturbed for 20 years. So you can see that the, uh, uh, what will be extinguished is a roosting site, the feeding and sites, and some of the pathways between them. So what we've got here basically is uh, a descriptive analysis of visually putting things on the screen, looking at them, repeating and building up a picture about behavioral ecology. But one of the reasons for taking this data out of, out of the system is to say, let's look at some other things here. We could use this data in other statistical programs. If you had to uh, be uh, fortunate enough to have been a student of the of various sciences, you probably had to learn how to use R. Or we could go to more advanced mapping programs like ArcMap. One of the things that we could begin to do with this data is to look at uh, flight trajectories and weather patterns. Uh, this is a particular site that shows weather patterns and uh, particularly wind patterns throughout the world. What we could do, for example, with this data beyond just simple mapping is to begin to look at uh, a question like this. Do eastern curlews anticipate adverse conditions and change course? or change course as a consequence of the conditions. That is, do they fly in it, they whoops, let's get away, or can they anticipate and move? This is one of uh, AAJ's colleagues, AAP, and MIPO uh, wetlands in Hong Kong in uh, mid-April this year. And this is uh, what AAP did, went north, hit some bad weather, turned around and went to a little wetland north of Townsville. Um, one of Amanda's birds from, uh, from Darwin uh, did exactly the same, flew up there, did this, went to this wetland north of Townsville. Uh, so did two um, uh, uh, Bartel Godwits. Um, so we could, you could, we could use this data we've got, bring in some, uh, some um, parametric data and some wind strength data and begin to develop some scenarios, develop some algorithms to actually begin to answer this kind of question. Um, I, ne I need to find a climatologist who could help me do that if there's one in the audience. Okay, so that's the end of my talk, taking the data from the satellite to mapping to the possibilities of going somewhat further. And there are some uh, key websites there for, uh, for doing this kind of work. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. So we're going to continue on with our um, Argos system and understanding uh, how, how the back end of it works. And we've got Holly from CLS Argos here to talk to us. Um, thanks, Amanda, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Argos satellite system. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. The Argos satellite system and its applications for bird tracking. So firstly, what is Argos? Argos is a global, non-profit, satellite-based data collection and positioning system dedicating to studying and protecting the Earth's environment. Argos is operated by CLS and governed through a partnership between NOAA, NASA, CNES, ISRO and UMASAT. Uh, the other thing about Argos, which some of you might not know, is we are non-profit and we've been around quite some time. We're celebrating our 40th birthday this year. So in a non-profit system, how do we establish costs? 
Well, all the wildlife users here in the room of Argos, you come under the JTA or the Joint Tariff Agreement. And the Joint Tariff Agreement provides an international mechanism to see cost-effective location and data processing of data collected through the Argos system. Um, basically how that works is that the revenue collected from the users should meet the cost for providing the service. And just a little note on that, in a cost recovery system, Basically, the more users, the better. So please, when you talk about satellite trucking, give us a mention because there are other satellite systems out there and the more users we have, the cheaper your prices are. Um, we generally establish prices over a five-year period and they're set for that time. And as of November 2017, we have a new pricing structure, which is you have a monthly fee of 15 euro and a daily fee of four euro. And for wildlife users, your costs are capped at 12 days per month, so 63 euro per month. So what about the current Argos system? So there are currently seven operational satellites or satellites <laughs> flying uh, with Argos um, instrumentation on them. They are low or Earth orbiting satellites, which orbit at about 850 kilometres from Earth. We have global coverage. Um, an average satellite pass is between 10 and 15 minutes. The average is probably around 12. It's between a frequency band of 401.650 plus or minus 30 kilohertz. Uh, and it's low transmission power, usually between 0.1 and 2 watts. And as Rob covered, it's a Doppler positioning system. So basically, it's based on the Doppler shift of the carrier frequency of the messages. So those satellites communicate with some ground antennas. Uh, there are 65 regional ground um, antennas. And if, you, if, if the satellite is also in view of an antenna uh, and the, the receiver at the same time, you can have real-time communication. Um, I did have a little video here to show you basically how Argos worked, but uh, the internet didn't like it. But I can play it for you later if you want to see it. So there's roughly 22,000 Argos and, um, active transmitters at any one time. And in any given month, there's around 4,500 active bird transmitters. Um, so you can see all the yellow data points. They're all birds. Um, and that, that's a really large wildlife uh, user group for us, and it's continuously growing with transmitters getting smaller. Um, and I want to talk about the future of the Argos system because things are changing. So earlier this year, we launched the uh, last of the Argos 3 satellites, METOP C. Um, and at the end of this year, we'll be launching the first uh, nanosat cube. CubeSat uh, prototype, that's the ANGELS project. And then we've got another launch early 2020 with ISRO, um, 2021 with CDARS, and we've got uh, UMASAT that are committed to launching satellites until 2036, so the system's quite secure. But what's really exciting about the future of the Argos system at the moment is uh, Kinase which we are newly in charge of operating the Argos system. So CLS are still uh, the people that you're communicating but with, but Kinase will be operating the satellite system itself and they will be launching 25 nanosats. Um, they're in, in uh, production right now and they're going up 2021 to be in operation in uh, 2022. Um, so what does that mean for you? Basically, it means a lot more data, um, a lot more passes. So what can you do with the Argos system? Well, you have your basic Argos services where you get your data collection and positioning, uh, data decoding and GDS decoding, which is more oceanography. You have customer support and you have access to Argos web, which Rob has showed you a little bit about, where you can view all your positions on a map. You can download all your available data, download Google Earth uh, files and manage all your user settings. You also have some value-added services that you can access. Um, so you can see along here we have some MedOcean data, um, and we also have some filtered locations here. Um, you can also have your data emailed to you directly, uh, Track and Lock, which is a service for uh, archival pop-up tags, fish tags. There's a lot of post-processing services, which I want to talk more about soon, and um, Metop data. So what is the data reprocessing? 
Well, this is our post-processing where you can reanalyze your histor historical data to improve all your locations, um, basically by applying a smoother filter over them. Um, you can retrieve your data in CSV or KML formats, and the data that you receive is filtered in least squares in a Kalman filter and a Kalman smoother algorithm. You can also have your data reprocessed with oceanography and METOC data, wind, uh, primary productivity, and you can receive all that file together. Um, METOC data. Uh, at CIS, we actually have a team of over 100 in-house oceanographers. So oceanography data is something that we do well. Um, and with some of this METOC data, you can basically draw a correlation between your animal's behaviour and its biochemical and physical environment. Uh, and benefit from our years of experience. So we've got over 20 years of experience in, in ocean data. There's lots of different data available. So here we've got sea surface temperature, phytoplankton, primary productivity, surface current, surface wind, clouds, ice cover, and many, many more. Um, you can see up there that's a drifting buoy that's floating along a anticyclonic eddy, so a clockwise eddy. And the one below is actually a raptor track that's moving with air temperature and wind. So thanks to Clive for kindly allowing me to use your oriental Pratt and Cole data just to give you a little how-to on how you can use this data and what it looks like. Um, so firstly, the post-processing services. This is just a quick tutorial, sorry. You can log into Arcos Web. Uh, if you go to reprocessing locations and click this little plus symbol, you're given the option to uh, select a time frame um, and you can reprocess your data by platform or program. Uh, it takes about anywhere from three hours to a day to get your data reprocessed um, and you'll get a little email alert once it's there um, and then you just download it straight from Argos Web. Um, you, you get KML files and you get Excel files too that contain all the different algorithms in there and some statistics. And what it looks like, well, this is the track you're familiar with. So this is a real-time Kalman filtered track. Um, I've exported this straight from Argos Web and that's what it looks like. Now, you're wondering why this looks worse. That's because it's the old least squares algorithm. So those of you that might have been doing some tracking prior to 2011 will be familiar with this algorithm. We changed in 2011 to a least squares algorithm, which improved accuracy um, dramatically. Um, some applications still use least squares. So if you're using pop-up tags, some of those use least squares tracking, or perhaps you wanted to keep some continuity with your data, you might choose to still use the old least squares method. I wouldn't advise it if you were doing anything else. Um, so I just want to compare to you the difference between the least squares, so how, how the algorithm has changed since 2011 and now. There's quite a lot of difference, and you can see a lot of those erroneous locations that um, Rob was talking about earlier, which are mostly B-class locations that are calculated with just one Argos message. So this is a reprocessed Kalman filtered track. So it's still the Kalman filter, but it has the benefit of being reprocessed, including all the data from the entire track. So you've seen that we've just removed a lot of those outliers and got rid of a whole lot of that error. So just to show you the difference, it's, it's quite big. Then we've got the Kalman Smooth track. Now this is the most accurate of the tracks. It's the most accurate estimate of Argos locations. And it's using an interacting multiple model fi uh, filter to significantly improve the location accuracy. And that's obtained using an interval multiple model smoothing technique. So just to compare that with your real-time track. Um, so what's it do? On average, the reprocessing reduces error by a third for those locations calculated based on two and three messages. And for those locations calculated with just one message, it's, it's halved. So if you've got some of those tracks that have a lot of those B-class locations, this is fantastic. Um, and just a close-up of that so you can really see the difference between all the tracks. Um, the yellow there is the least squared, so if we remove that straight off the bat, we get a lot better. Then we remove the real time and we've just got the Kalman filtered and the Kalman smooth tracks. So you can see it's quite a lot of difference. And for those of you that would like to learn a little bit more about how that's done, um, have a chat to me. We've got plenty of technical papers that I can direct you towards. 
Um, so what else? The METOC data. Um, so this is the Pratt & Cole data shown with surface wind and sea level anomaly. Um, and you can also do this through Argos Web. Some of you may have used the free trial that you had on your program, which unfortunately is just finished, but if you'd like to have a look at it on your program, come and see me, and we can do that. Uh, so how do you do it? Uh, once this is activated in your program, which I can, you can basically just go into your map and click on it. It's a little cloud symbol there. You've got a number of op options to choose from. This is just the trial, which has less than the full version. Um, I've chosen surface wind for the Pratt & Gold migration. Um, you, you might find things like primary productivity if you're working on seabirds is fantastic. You can get some really good correlations there. Um, so you can display all your tracks or just focus on one. Um, and you can actually click along any point on your map and get the corresponding METOP data for that point. So this is the wind data from each one of those locations. Um, you can also animate the tracks in here. And you can change around the settings to speed it up or slow it down. Uh, you will find if you're using a large data set or you're, you're covering a large area like this, it can take a little bit of um, time to load. So you might want to slow down your settings so that you've got the, the data in the background has time to load. Uh, so yes, you want to activate me top data. And just, and this is just the bird moving. You can see it's moving along with those surface winds there. And you can have more than just wind data there. You can have some raster information there too. So you might choose to have wind and sea level anomaly at the same time. It can be quite interesting. Okay. Now, it's not just the data available in Argos Web because you might be interested in, uh, you actually want the information, not just the visual. You can download any of the data sets. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, Far more than I, that, that you can see in the trial there. So there's um, oh, sargassium, for example, might be a different thing. Um, but there's plenty available in the data store. And you can basically select what area you want to go, go to as well. So cost will differ too, depending on whether you want a huge area or you're looking at a small area, you can tailor it. Um, oh, here's some examples of what's available in there. So you can see there's quite a lot of things you can get from the data store. We've also got a standalone platform, which is online called Seawater. Uh, and in Seawater, you can visualize your tracks like in Argos Web, and you have a whole range of data you can access, which you can also customize and get certain data available into Seawater. Argos products. So there are many, many Argos products out there, uh, many, many transmitters, for example. But CLS, we make few. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the Argos goniometer. And also, if, if you actually are looking for a, um, a reference for what platforms might be available for your program, just let me know. We've got a book that'll basically give you all the PTTs, the Argos certified ones. So the goniometer, what is it? It is a platform finder um, and a direction finder, which you can use to recover your satellite tags. It receives all Argos PTTs within a 100 kilometer radius. Um, it provides a direction and a distance estimate, so it gives you a bearing and also a signal strength. If you have a uh, GPS tag which we can decode, you can get the GPS location on the GONIO. Um, all received data is stored and can be downloaded via uh, USB <coughs> as well, so you can basically plug it in and directly receive all your data. Um, so I've just got some pictures here. Oh, and testing tags as well. It's really, really handy. Some people might have a bunch of tags in a storeroom. They might not necessarily have your Argos ID number on them and you don't know if the battery's still good. It's a really quick, easy way to turn on your tags. It's going to tell you what Argos ID it is so you know which one it is and you know if it's working or not. And that's just a little picture of me testing a dugong tag there. Um, this is one of our Flying Fox users with a Flying Fox cover, uh, collar that they've recovered using a goniometer. And maybe you have keener eyes than me, but there is actually a transmitter in this picture of the tree. Um, it's there. So perhaps some of you might have uh, been able to wander past and find that, but the, the gonio 
basically will give you a direction towards that tree. They knew the tag was there. They're walking around the tree looking and finally look up and there it is. So it's, it's really fantastic for recovering tags. It's also great for monitoring your animals. So if ethics is a concern, for example, um, you can see that your collars or your tags aren't doing any harm to the animal because you can track it out and directly find it. And you can just monitor their behaviour in real time. Um, what's funny about this particular picture was that these guys assumed the tag was actually off the bat because the bat hadn't been moving. And so they were using their gonio to go and find the tag and getting really frustrated with the gonio because they're like, now it's over here, but now it's over here. And it was actually just on the bat, which had been uh, disturbed by them and it was flying around. But they got some really great photos for their ethics, so they're really happy to have a healthy, happy bat there. Um, we're on a bunch of websites and social media. There's a list of them there um, on Facebook, so please, if you want to share anything with us, that's great, and through Twitter. Um, and that's it. So thank you, everyone. Next up, we've got uh, Dean with a, a quick chat. Thank you. So I'm going to take you from high tech back to low tech. Not the company, the method. <laughs> Um, so that Argos stuff is where we want to get to with the Regent Honey Eaters, as I touched on before, but uh, I guess at the moment um, we, we wanted to put this in for people that are working on species that are small, uh, that are still uh, limited to radio tracking. Uh, so this is a pretty low-tech little talk about the sort of things you can do with data that you're collecting. So what do we do with the stuff that we get? Uh, again, in terms of what we've been doing with Regent Honey Eaters and our captive releases, I'll stress that the main reason we've been sticking transmitters on birds is to monitor survival. So uh, all these other cool behavioural things would be neat to know, but at least for our releases, we just want to know that our birds, once they're released, uh, actually live. So that's priority number one. Um, we also use the, the birds that are wearing radio transmitters as a means to find the birds that are banded only. So some of our birds are too small but to put transmitters on or we don't want to put them on young birds to stress them. Um, so we use it as a, as a tool to get us sightings of additional birds that we release. Um, in the past couple of years, Regent honey eaters go very quiet when they start breeding. So a cryptic species becomes even more cryptic. So they can be really hard to find. So we have been deploying the transmitters onto males to try and find breeding pairs when they're settling down and nesting. Um, and also we've, we've started to play a little bit with trying to get a handle into post-breeding dispersal once they leave uh, the park. Uh, again, I touched on that uh, in my previous talk, but just to re-emphasise that the survival and finding birds post-release is, is still the priority for us. Um, I guess my talk's probably a bit more about data collection. So those Argos systems are beautiful because your data collection happens at your computer while you drink your morning coffee. Uh, for VHF radio transmitters, it's old school in the field tracking birds around the landscape. So we initially uh, were limited to um, GPSs and, and data sheets. So uh, staff and volunteers would head out into the field for the day We'd have uh, all of our birds wearing transmitters have individual frequencies. So a, a tracking team would be um, set up with, say, five birds. They're your five birds to find today. Uh, and you walk around the forest trying to find birds. Uh, and we were getting visual confirmation. So we were wanting people to actually lay eyes on birds and, and read bands to confirm that they're surviving and that they're thriving. And then we had that wonderful job where you get back at the end of the day and all of our GPSs have waypoint one, two, three, four and five. So we had to sit at the end of the day and recode all of our, so download our GPS data and then recode all of our ones and twos into blue, white and orange, black uh, to make them relate to the actual birds that we were observing. 
Um, never mind the fact that we're also collecting habitat variables. So what are they doing when we find them? Are they foraging? Are they breeding? If they're foraging, what are they foraging in? This was all manually captured uh, and you know, it's the data that just sits on the shelf because it's too bloody hard and takes too long to do anything with. Uh, so we, regardless, by doing this and collecting this data and recoding it, we can, we can make static maps. So we can show, for example, in the 2010 and 2013 releases, um, have I got a pointer somewhere? Uh, hopefully you can see there's a black X in the, in the central cluster of orange and green dots. That's the release site, but you can see, um, thank you. Thank you, so there's our release site. Um, but you can see, based on the different colours of the dots from the two maps, you know, 5,000 odd waypoints out of two captive releases, they did slightly different things in each year. Yes, there were some commonalities in terms of areas, but there were big clusterings up here in the 2013 release and much more use of this part of the park and the surrounding landscape. So we know that different cohorts of release birds do different things. Um, it's descriptive, but at least it still gives us some insight into the way the birds um, move around the landscape post-release. Well, we realised a couple of years ago that uh, we could try and make this a little bit more um, intuitive and easier, so we switched over to a program called Survey123, uh, which is an app for smartphones that's ESRI supported. Uh, so we could collect all the data in the field. This is a fully customizable form, and I'll show you a, a, the next slide has some more images of that. Uh, you collect real-time data, you set up your pro forma effectively, and you enter it in the field so you don't have to recode data, you don't have to um, edit bird data, you don't have to enter bird data, and it also allows um, for managers, you can stalk your staff and make sure they're working hard, because you can see real-time data being entered. So I could sit in my office and see the volunteers out uh, as they're logging um, bird sightings. Not that I'd ever do that. Um, so you can set up your form however you like, um, but the key thing is as soon as you're logging a sighting and you're filling in the data, it pours into a data table that sits uh, in an ESRI format that you can then link to your data that you're collecting for location. So, to cut down on your handling time of this data, uh, it is a, a really cool thing to do. Needs a bit of support. We, we thankfully working with um, DELP, you know, Victorian Government Department, lots of GIS support to get that set up. Um, that's what it looks like if you're looking at the real live data in the field. So we customise it so that every time someone logged a sighting up would pop another a dot. Uh, so you can keep track of who's seeing which birds uh, and where they're getting them. Uh, and if you're sitting in your office, that's what the interface looks like. So a pretty cool uh, tool for this sort of work. What do we do with the waypoint data? Uh, as I said, this is a, a, a low technology version of what we've talked about so far. Very nuts and bolts. You can throw dots on maps in products like ArcMap or, or QGIS. Um, so here are all of the all of the observations from the 2017 captive release. Um, so you can see that the majority of records are in and around the Chilton Mount Pilot National Park, uh, but we had a pair of birds decide that Wangaratta was a better, a better place to try and breed uh, after we'd let them go. You can obviously then colour code them depending on the, the, you know, the, the birds of interest. So as well as our released birds from 2017, we had re returning 2015 birds and we had some wild birds. Um, so you can display that sort of information. That's zoomed in uh, on the National Park itself, again colour-coded to different cohorts of birds. You can then start to play around with time-based stuff. Again, this is static, we're not showing you nice GIFs or animations where you're seeing movements, although I have played with that, so you can do it. Um, but you can pre pre prepare and present maps that shows that you know, the birds get released here in 2017, but over the journey, um, they coalesced into a couple of key regions, both inside and outside the park. So you can demonstrate over the life of the project, uh, they shifted positions um, as the project went on. You can also pick individuals and you can compare and contrast. So here's orange, metal, green, green. Um, I don't know why we don't have any maps here, um, dots here, but anyway, you can see again, um, 
spent some time in this part of the park, but as the, the life of the project went on, it filtered out into some private property. Uh, if you compare that to blue, white, orange, metal, another bird, uh, a couple of records post-release just here, but then largely stayed sedentary. So you can pick apart changes in behaviour. Some birds wander, some birds are much more stationary. When we get our long-term resightings of our birds, you can go into something like ArcMap with their X, Y to Line tool, so you can graphically show where are our birds being resighted uh, 12 months or more post-release. So we can show that even though this is our release site, over the journey we've had birds go out to South Gippsland and back. We've had two birds go to Gippsland, one then headed to East Gippsland, one headed to Melbourne. And only about a month ago we've had one make it up to the suburbs of Sydney. So you can use that tool to demonstrate. Uh, and then we've had some students look at things like overlaying on digital elevation models to look at landscape use, so which parts of the release uh, landscape are they using, uh, and when you look at what, what is the um, elevation available in the study area, if you like, they have a preferred zone. It's likely tied to the preferred habitats, um, but you might be running a project where you, you're trying to work that out, uh, so you can collect those data, you can, you can analyse it to be able to look at those things. Um, we've also played around a little bit with what happens with the range of the birds over the time. As I showed those maps earlier where some birds wander and some birds stay uh, much more sedentary, you can do um, foraging um, areas over time. Uh, and for example, we showed in one of our releases that certainly as, as the release goes on, the size of their foraging territory decreases because as they start to breed, they're they're centralised around a, a smaller area. Again, this is all going to be dependent on the questions that you're asking for the project that you're running, but they're the sorts of things you can do uh, with this data. So in summary, even with radio transmitter data, um, that is still uh, somewhat basic in terms of what other options are available today. You can look at survival, you can look at movements of cohorts and individuals, you can link it to habitat and other supplementary questions and data that you're collecting, and then you can run post hoc stuff like kernel density estimates and digital elevation models. So it's still a very useful way to collect and analyse data. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Our final speaker in uh, the data analysis collection and presentation session, and then we'll go into our panel session. Uh, hi everybody, morning. This is a really exciting workshop. Thanks for organising it. Um, I'm Holly. Um, I'm British, sorry. And <laughs> I, um, I've been working on seabirds, um, tracking seabirds for the last 10 years now. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit to you about today about um, a load of different ways that you can analyse um, tagging data. So um, a lot of the work you're seeing was done during my PhD um, at the University of Oxford, and some of my more recent work has been on seabirds in New Zealand. So you're going to see some stuff to do with New Zealand seabirds and some stuff to do with UK seabirds. I hope that's OK. I work a lot with data loggers rather than transmitters. So that's things like GPS loggers and geolocators, so um, devices where you have to recapture the bird. Um, and one of the biggest problems with logger data is often there's a lot of it. So you might download a device that's got thousands of GPS points. Um, it can often be quite noisy, as we've already seen. Um, geolocators are sort of renowned for this problem. Um, and what if you put on multiple loggers? You can have timestamps in different formats and you need to put them together. Basically, you can have what I've called a bit of a data nightmare. And I meant to add something to this slide and forgot, but it was just going to be a great big thing saying, use R. So all of the things I'm talking to you about today are open source, 
open access, e.g. free. And I think probably what we need is some kind of shared Google document where we can put together all of the different open access ways of doing your data analysis. And that includes things like free um, open access GIS software as well, like QGIS. Um, R is amazing. There's a steep learning curve, but there is an incredible online community out there. Um, you can, if you're on Twitter, get on Twitter, use the RStats hashtag if you have problems. Um, people who use R generally love R and love helping other people to love R. So I would highly recommend getting involved. You can also contact um, R for data scientists. And in Australia and New Zealand, there's the Australian New Zealand Open Research Network, um, which is also an online community of people who are doing open, open research, which involves using R a lot of the time. Anyway, sorry, banging on about R. Um, come and talk to me if you want to. How, do you max, how to maximize your tagging methods? Tags are costly. They often cost a lot of money. They cost you a lot of time, and sometimes they can also cost your researchers their hands. Um, they're also costly for the birds to carry. Um, many of the tags we work with show where animals have been, or where they're going, or what they're doing in terms of space use, but buried in that data can be lots of useful behavioral information. And your brains are incredible. Your brains are really good at seeing patterns in data. And I'm sure, I mean, I've tagged it with a little arrow there, but um, just by looking at this horrible stream of, this is actually wet and dry data from a geolocator, um, you can already see that there are some patterns emerging in that data. The same with this. This is wet and dry information plotted alongside light. Um, and you, your brain is really, really good at identifying things that are going on there. And of course, you could manually go through your hundreds of tags and extract that information by just clicking day to day to day and saying, OK, what was the bird doing on this day? But that's a, going to take a really long time, and B, is really unreproducible. And so the great thing about doing some of these analyses and automating some of these analyses that I'm going to talk to you about is that you can, they are reproducible. So you can do the same thing again and again and again with different tags and um, different individuals and different species. So the simplest way to extract behavioral data from, from your tagging from your tags would be using something like a threshold method. So the idea is that you classify your data into different groups depending on some kind of threshold. It could be to do with speed. It could be to do with tortuosity of a track if we're talking about a GPS track. You could also be thinking about perhaps you've put a geolocator on, so it's got a, a saltwater immersion logger. So it could be the amount of time spent wet. And what you can see here is a GPS track um, where the points have been classified into three different groups based on the speed that the bird was moving at. So there were foraging points in green, resting points in blue, and flight points in red. Um, so that helps you to extract um, a bit more information out of that. So that's the GPS tag. You can also go and down into some much more complicated routes. I say they're complicated, but everything I'm presenting to you has an existing R package related to it, um, where someone's gone and done the actual calculation of the algorithms that you can then use in your data. So a classic example of classifying any kind of data is to use a Gaussian mixture model, which essentially extracts different distributions from your data and puts those data into different pockets. So in this um, situation, I used a geolocator on a Manx shear water. Um, but instead of looking at where the bird was going, which is the traditional use of a geolocator, I actually um, had these on during the breeding season. And we were able to uncover the phenology of the breeding behavior from multiple different colonies around the UK by just classifying the saltwater immersion and light data into different behaviors. So we could see when the birds switched between um, incubation, foraging during the incubation, track incubation season, and um, foraging during the chick rearing season. You can get even more complicated. 
and use something, this is very popular now, a hidden Markov model. Um, this is a type of state space model where basically you are taking your data, classifying it in a very similar way to a Gaussian mixture model. So you're looking at the distribution of the data, but it actually takes into account um, what happened previously. So if a bird was foraging in its previous state, it's more likely to be classified as foraging in its current state. So it takes into account time and you can kind of create a time series. Um, and it gives you some idea of the probability that the bird spent that time period in that particular behavioral class. So here we classify GPS tracks um, in order to look for the foraging distributions of Manx shearwaters breeding in the UK. Um, what is the point? I, I get it, like, um, it's really cool. We put the devices on birds, we get this really nice map out, we see where they went. Um, it's really useful to see that distribution information. Um, but there's more that we can do. Um, we can uncover previously undiscovered behavior. For example, um, my PhD supervisor discovered mid-ocean mid stopover behavior in the Manx Shearwater by using Gaussian mixture modeling. Um, you can spatially represent specific behavior, perhaps as a time when your species is more vulnerable and we want to know when it's doing that particular behavior, where it is, so we can try and conserve it better. Um, we're putting devices on animals and it causes them to have some cost, even if it's small, even if it's not the cost of their life, but we have a responsibility to get as much out of them, out of those tags as possible. I think we do anyway. Um, there are heaps of methods out there now. I've stuck a few up there. Um, there's some review papers and I'll just leave the slide hanging around. Um, state space models, neural networks, breakpoint analyses, um, a lot of very cool ways of discriminating different behaviors from your data. Um, and my biggest suggestion would be to come and chat with me if you want to know more um, and get online and have a look and see what people are doing because it's, it's really, really cool. Thanks. I did forget to show just the analysis slide at the top. From the survey questions, um, this is why we put a little bit of effort into the analysis. You'll see 47% of us have actually not yet got to the data and analysis part. <laughs> and I can, um, and I'm, yeah. <laughs> so um, the great thing, everybody that spoke is there ready to speak to you and answer your questions and offer help, and as, as is all the other experienced people in the room. Um, next is our panel. Yeah, um, so we've got a panel session. So if, um, the speakers want to come down the front. Dean, Begita, Holly Kirk, Rowan Mott, Ken Gospel like to come down the front and um, answer questions that people might have. Mm -hmm. um, are you okay standing up, guys? Yeah. Um, uses. Technology use, yep. Can <laughs> okay, and um, basically I tried to decipher in from your surveys what you were using and why. Oh, sorry, why you were research, why were you using tags? So that's what we came up with. Question time, any questions? Panels here. Anyone else from the anybody else from the audience that think they've got an answer as well? Put your hand up. We've got half an hour roughly. Go. <laughs> Hi, um, I was interested in the attachment methods that were being shown and one of the questions I had was about the, um, the weight distribution on the bird, particularly its symmetricalness, like so if you're putting uh, something as a leg mounted um, light meter, say, on one leg of, say, a regent honey eater or something small like that, is that going to affect their, their ability to fly through being not evenly distributed as a weight? 
Anybody? <laughs> um, I'll have first go at that. Not, obviously, we've not used um, a left or right sided weighted transmitter, but as I mentioned with Regent Honey, it is in our captive release. When we trialled the, the backpack harnesses and the tail mounted transmitters, um, I don't have any, any data other than anecdotal observations, but when, you, when we put a backpack harness on a bird, and you watch a Regent honey eater flying, uh, unless you're told it's wearing a transmitter, you can't tell that it's wearing a transmitter. So in my very simple brain, that means we've done a good job and the bird's OK with carrying it like that. Yes, it'll have a cost and whatever. But we definitely notice, or I certainly noticed, with the birds that were fitted with the tail-mounted transmitters, it looked like they were doing a wheelie. So the tail tended to drop. Uh, and we, uh, as well as that, Birds were flicking their tails, so they were actively trying to dislodge the transmitter. Uh, and that was one of the reasons that I was you know, pretty vocal in saying I don't think we should use this attachment technique again, quite apart from the fact they didn't stay on as long. Uh, but I do think it is an, in an important consideration. And um, some discussions I've had with ethics committees around the percentage of weight that you're putting on a bird, obviously we want to keep it low. Um, but I think in certain species, are, are probably the most important consideration is actually where you put that transmitter. Um, so for, for the one project I've you know, worked on, um, having the, the transmitter at the back definitely appeared to change the centre of gravity in the bird when it was flying. OK, and there has been a study, and that um, Professor Wilson, Rory Wilson, there's been a study done on gannets, and it shows that if you put the tag on the tail, they actually pitch, so they fly up. So I'm happy. Here we go. I just want a similar topic. Has anybody, or do you know of any studies that have been done comparing the effects of, um, on birds that have both leg bands and a backpack transmitter, birds that have just leg bands and birds that have just a backpack transmitter and no leg bands? I just wonder about the combined weight of having leg bands plus transmitters. I'm not aware of any studies like that, but I'm happy to be corrected. Um, you, well, my understanding is to stick anything on a bird, you've got to stick a band on it. So you'd probably struggle to run a transmitter-only tr uh, trial unless you were doing it in captivity. Um, you don't? OK. Um, you do in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm not sure of anyone that's done uh, that that trial, yeah. Can I just add to that, Heather? Um, I don't know whether or not it's been tested explicitly. I think that's one of the challenges. So the Japanese, in case people are wondering who I am and why I'm here when I haven't actually said anything today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Birgitta Hansen. I'm running a project on Latham Snipe where I feel like we've trialled lots and lots of different methods with only very limited success. And I've co corresponded with a lot of people here about transmitter design. Um, the Japanese we worked with, they put uh, five transmitters on snipe and they didn't put any leg bands on. Um, they didn't explicitly test that. I don't think their success rates were very high with or without the band, so I'm not sure anyone, yeah, to my knowledge, does that. Fine. There is a published study, I think, last year, using color bands and color bands and gear <laughs> and the outcome measure was uh, the return rate from, uh, uh, from, from migration. And there was no difference between a colour band return rate and a colour band loss due to Did everybody hear that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that was probably the Emily Weiser yeah. uh, study. Uh, and she uh, looked at uh, attaching geolocators uh, on a number of shorebirds. She uh, co collaborated with a number of researchers uh, all around the world. And it's a, it's a very nice paper that shows uh, very little very little impact of geolocators uh, on a range of different uh, weights of birds. Yeah. Um, can I just quickly comment on that? On, in, on Roebuck Bay with our satellite tag bird, we do identify with um, engraved leg flags or colour bands. And I think that's a great way, because we often see them on the bay, um, and it's a great way to actually see they're roosting. The great way to actually see how the birds are after we put these transmitters on. I think it's very useful to know how the birds faring after that. Yeah, I just like good uh, discussions and talks. But one of the things that a lot of people are missing on the transmitters and the leg band and everything else 
a lot of work that I've worked in 28 years in zoos and 20 years in science, the thing we miss a lot, we need to do a lot of trials in captivity first. A lot of birds get banded and, and um, transmitted on pretty regularly in the early days. But when you come back and do these trials that Dean's doing and everything in captivity, you can see all the methods that the first question was. You can know the bird's movements, you can know the word away feeds, it travels, you can dense the cages out, you can do all the techniques in captivity before you take it in the wild. Then you answer all the ethical questions because ethics is a big play here. And when you've got to answer the ethics, it's a tough one because if you don't have the right people on those ethics committees, they don't really know. And you have to explain to them when you've got to go and have an interview with them. And that's the, the um, lynch of everything we do now in research. And I just want to stress that. So if you look at what you're doing and the answer with the bands and everything else, banding's changed a lot with cutter coating. You can get powder coated bands that replace the colour bands. You can get all a lot of things in banding now, it's changing as well. So the session in the banding I think would be good to people come along and listen to that as well. Thanks. I really enjoyed it. It was really good. Um, I've got a couple of questions. The first one is advice. Um, when they turned the 2G network off last year, we, like a lot of other people in Australia, lost a load of money with our uh, GSM uh, equipment. What can you advise to us to have to go back to our sponsors and say, well, we're really sorry but um, we're going to wait for the next wave of equipment to come out. So what do you recommend to us with these GSM? We're we using GSM net collars because um, I'm being told that it's 3G now, but 3G might, might, might run out fairly soon. I, I realise some of the other people might have an input on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, two, two G. It's a very fast-moving industry, Telco, and two G is literally like the stone tablet having yeah. stuff chipped into it. Three um, G is not far behind. Four G is what's currently deployed. Five G will make it obsolete. So, while five G is literally at pilot rollout. It's a very few short years before 5G will dominate the telco world completely. <laughs> it's a problem that everyone has with technology. It moves so fast, it goes out of date pretty fast. I'd say shoot for at least 4G. 3G's probably only got a few <laughs> years left, yeah. Secondly, just quickly, I've been asked to ask this question from the UK. Uh, other than the Grey Teal study, uh, do you have any information or advice on fitting satellite trackers to ducks? Because there's ethical issues here. Anyone on ducks? <laughs> Marcel? This has been recorded, so if we can get the microphone to you. Uh, I'm sorry, but you were referring to Grey Teal. So you're referring to the work done by David Rocha yes. many that's, years ago? That's the only one that they could find with regard to a reference to getting an ethics approval over the line for fitting radio trackers to waterfowl in the UK. Okay. Well, th there is more. There are studies done by um, John McAfoy. Uh, a PhD student. If you know more. Yeah, so they, they, they publish studies on Pacific Black Duck. That's the latest I know. I heard that recently in New South Wales there's a project underway. We're also planning on doing it ourselves on a, a variety of duck species, again in Victoria. And how are you going to fit the harness? Are you going to harness stuff? Harness, yeah. Oh, oh, I'm fine, yeah. <laughs> Did the manufacturers have any ideas on ducks? Yep, come in. Uh, yeah, so uh, you should also come and speak to Yu Hui. Uh, there he is, yeah. So he has been doing uh, duck tracking in China, also with harnesses. Yeah? Okay, and then I'm going over to Onatella. Excuse 
Thank you. Uh, we are duck biologists ourselves, and we have a lot of clients who use our transmitters to track ducks. So first, uh, it seems that for dabbling ducks, which don't dive, Teflon harness is quite okay. Although maybe not everyone thinks that way, but it yeah. is fairly commonly used. And for diving ducks, most commonly used type is implant. But I mean, it's primarily in the US and Canada where people use that. We used that a little bit in Europe, but yeah, but it depends on country where animal welfare approves that, that method of deployment. I think I remember Danny wrote something about ducks in your survey. No? Okay, got it wrong. Oh, thanks. I would love to get a quick answer from each of you. What what percentage of your time and energy is spent on the technology and met field methods versus doing the real biology? And do you like it that way? Can you define real biology? <laughs> you got me there. Thank, really stepping through the, the, the ecology and then behavior of your animals versus uh, just wrestling with the, the methods and techniques. I guess... Um, Analysis. I'm going to start. Yeah. <laughs> um, as in time in the field versus analysis? Just, just, or? just your mental energy. Do you have to spend too much time wrestling oh, okay. with the, the devices and the techniques and the attachments and your training your field crew and that whole half of it versus doing serious analysis that's revealing cool stuff? Um, off the top of my head, a percentage would be probably 20% time spent doing that, 80% time trying to work out what the hell the data is doing. Um, that's probably an over-exaggeration. Over but um, I think you cannot um, overemphasize the value of field training. Um, and I was very lucky to, when I first started doing this, to work with some really experienced seabird naturalists natural historians who knew a lot about the behavior and the biology of the birds that we were working with. So we kind of learned that to begin with. So knowing the birds, knowing how they feel, knowing how they respond in the hand is the first step. And the second step is learning how to actually deploy the loggers. Um, and we spend probably I don't know, in a month long, just my most recent training mission in a month-long um, tracking stint on an island, uh, probably spent about a week actually training my assistants until he was ready to do deployments by himself, by which I meant I was holding the bird and he was putting the devices on. I hope that helps answer the question. We'll probably have to save questions for lunchtime because there's one extra thing that we were doing. Try an announcement. Yes. Yeah. If I could just add, uh, a couple of people have said this morning, uh, in terms of geolocators, uh, the difficulty of analysing, uh, and they're absolutely dead right. But anyone interested in geolocators uh, would be very interested to know that there's a new paper just published in the last couple of days by Simeon Levosky, who is almost the king of geolocator analysis at the moment, um, and that's in the Journal of Applied Ecology, uh, and it's all to do with the analysis, uh, the latest techniques, R techniques of geolocators, and also as an accompanying manual for um, for, for uh, that analysis. Uh, so I just passed that, that message on. Just one more comment from Holly here. Very quickly, we've talked a lot about um, um, satellite transmitters. This is a GPS tracker which you can buy off the shelf for $60. You take it out of its plastic wrapping. It's a logger, so you do need to retrieve it. This one's in shrink wrap plastic. It's called an I Got You. Um, that's something you can use. I think this is about Seven grams? Anyway, I'm just saying it's out there. The technology's out there. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars. Can we put that on the table? Yeah. So I just wanted to just 
you made a comment about training people. Um, for the Latham Snipe project, we have done, I think, three or four years of field work, uh, which is focused on, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a dozen or so days of actual field work throughout the spring, summer season. I've spent three years in Canberra training people, including children, on how to safely capture and handle snipe and put transmitters on, well, not obviously satellite transmitters, but the whole process of how, the welfare, how you catch birds, how you monitor birds. I would think, we haven't got a huge amount of data from SNIPE, so we don't spend a lot of time with the analysis at the moment, but I would think that about 90% of the project has been in doing the research and training the people so they can do it themselves. So I think a significant investment of time probably goes in across all these projects to that field-based work. Thank you. Thanks uh, to everyone at the panel, and we'll just have an announcement from Greg Jensen. Yeah, I can't see him. Greg, you here? Oh. <laughs> um, Come on down. Uh, I've just been from here, if everybody can hear. Yeah. Um, I'm part of a, a little uh, cohort of pelican files, which include these characters here, I can see the of the word, um, who are part of that 20% of, of people <coughs> who responded to uh, Greg's questionnaire, who know natural about this sort of stuff. And uh, I'm very pleased to hear uh, a large number of the, the speakers and lots of other people discussing uh, uh, this sort of stuff with us uh, say, well, it's a very steep learning curve mm -hmm. when you start. I was wondering if there's a uh, perceived need and an interest uh, in doing it from some of the people on the panel, but also some of the other people in the audience uh, with a lot of experience to create a, a kind of a, a how-to, simple, easily important Here's some guys, key papers, key methods, key, uh, key things that uh, you might need to be able to answer for, for ethics applications and that sort of thing, for even scientific applications. Um, in the form of a sort of a review up or something like that, uh, I've got in mind that, that uh, you know, the physical observation papers uh, in EMU, something in, in that order. Perhaps I'm out of line and I've missed the fact that there might be some Bible of, of you know, a, a 15 page <laughs> concentrated answer to all of my questions. Uh, no, no, <laughs> would anybody have liked to see that at the beginning of their study? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Would anybody like to help me create such a thing? Please meet me outside uh, after this session. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll definitely have lots of time over lunch and over the next few days to catch up with other people. Uh, and we're, so we're closing the workshop now. I wanted to give a final thank you to everybody here that contributed, uh, particularly to Grace, the organiser. And I just have some certificates of appreciation. <laughs> thank you, Grace. So also to our amazing sponsors that have contributed to the conference, CLS Argos, Druid Technology, Low Tech and Ornatella. Please come on down. And just thank you so, so much to everybody that gave me a hand, all the speakers, all the people that gave me advice and help because um, no way I could have done that, got this done without your help. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, everybody.
outside the area. He recaptured several birds. Just test now. Yeah. 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 Yeah.